Good morning. Oh, five seconds. Good morning, commissioners. Happy Tuesday. Yeah. All right, so commissioners, we have a full agenda today. Um, to start us off in the morning, we have a couple of presentations and updates. But before we even get to those, I would actually like to give our city clerk an opportunity to share a little update and summary of how the primary election went. So uh, our, our clerk's very first election here in the city of Grand Rapids. It went. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, Joel, no, hey. fill us in. <laughs> yeah. uh, oh, more specific. Okay. I know, I know. So, Joel, no, five minutes, no, fill us in. How sure. Did no, I, I think as a whole, it went, it went very well. Um, going, into the, going into this primary election, looking at historical numbers for the city of Grand Rapids in a um, every two-year election, usually it's been 15%, 11%. Um, because of the interest that's been going on in um, national politics and having spirited, I'll say spirited, open primaries this year for governor, I expected maybe 20%, and we were, we were at 28%. Yes, yes, so we were, we were seeing a higher than normal um, absentees, but um, we had a group that was going out um, door to door canvassing, getting people to sign up for absentees. So we had about 1,200 absentee ballots that didn't come in. But a good number of those who requested absentee ballots asked for end up going to the polls too because they were surrendering surrendering their ballots or filling out an affidavit. But what that did do was um, the the numbers that we had ordered for ballots. So if you saw stuff news come out Oakland County, they're running out of ballots. We were getting to a point where we were getting close in a few precincts. We never did run out of ballots, but we did have to run some of our extra stock that we were using for duplicating in the absentee counting board out to precincts. So there were, was a delay in a couple of precincts of getting ballots out to them. Um, so um, so looking at those those numbers, we we made a um, we had made a prediction of how many ballots to order, and we hit it right on. And some, some we had ex extra ballots. Um, so it was amazing to see um, the turnout for that. But it wasn't, there weren't really a lot of lines during the day. It was just, a, it, 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 talking to the chairman, it was just, it was just steady. It was, just, there was just constantly always someone, somebody <laughs> voting. We did have a couple issues with a couple of the tabulators. It was a little bit humid last Tuesday. Um, and a couple of those um, gymnasiums like Garfield Park Gym, um, a couple of the schools that don't have air conditioning or didn't have them running, it was a little warm in there for the workers. Um, and the ballots can get a little bit of moisture and gets a little, a little funny. Um, so we did, have to, we did have to change out a couple tabulators, so we'll make sure with our vendor to make sure that they're all top notch ready to go for November. Um, we had a, some challenges with um, some of the workers, some of um, seem to be the season for hips and knees for a lot of our election workers. So on um, this summer, so they'll be back the, this November um, working. So we we implemented a whole bunch of um, new, new election inspectors this year, um, getting them fully trained um, was a little bit interesting. And so what I did learn is I learned a lot on election day as far as things that we need to watch for um, for for training and make sure that we're um, understanding what's happening. Um, I did make sure that the mayor knew when we were having issues, um, especially when the Grand Rapids Press and M or, and others were calling and saying, we're hearing this. So I wanted to make sure that our communications team and the mayor knew what was going on um, just in case. And my bonus was I got to see Commissioner Lanier in her precinct. So that was kind of like a bonus point for the day. What? So so my, my, goal for, my goal for election day was to um, hit all 77 precincts or 67 locations. I made it just over half. Um, sorry, sorry, First Ward Commissioners, I never made it west of the river, but I did make it to some of your precincts that were east of the river. So I made it to Buchanan and Burton and Cedar Chavez. So I, I did make it to some of the precincts. I just, I had this grand plan. I started up in the second ward. I was way up on the north side and they said, we're having a problem. Um, down at one of the precincts on the southeast side. So um, I was hitting rush hour all the way to get up with Franklin close and wealthy. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it, was yeah. it was interesting to get, get getting around the city on election day. However, um, shout out to my staff. They did, did great. Um, 311 did a great job working to the 311 program we have is that department is fantastic of backing us up with phone calls and um, getting information through. Um, and I think I haven't looked at the numbers yet. We had 30, oh, by the way, it was 38,000 voters on election day. Um, so 
so that that was that's the that's the big number for the day, and uh, I haven't I looked at the numbers, but from what I was looking at, as far as spoiled ballots, usually we have high spoiled ballots because people couldn't figure out the cross vote, um, and we I think between the communications department and our office and everybody saying stay in your lane, and and the the spoiled ballots seem to be a lot lower than it has been in the past because that's a lot of ballots that would be used up potentially giving us ballot issues if we had a lot of spoiled ballots, so. As a whole, I think it was a good day. I think I got home at four o'clock in the um, morning. In the morning, <laughs> but we, we but we did beat Cascade Township. Oh, sorry, Cascade Township. <laughs> Little but, friendly but, clerk but, competition. Yeah, clerk competitions. Who gets in? So, um, and then the county canvas is. Uh, remember, unofficial results are online right now. Um, the the county has just got to City of Grand Rapids right now. So now I'm getting text from the election director to saying. We're to Grand Rapids, so we had we had one precinct that has to be retabulated. West Catholic, the precinct at West Catholic High School, their their tabular wasn't working, so voters voted in. Um, so their results will change from what it was unofficially on election day, um, because their ballot they had about a hundred or so ballots that were in the auxiliary bin, so they'll be retabulated today. So remember, everything is unofficial till it's official. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I think Thanks. as a whole, um, and then I finished off the week by going to the Institute for Healing Racism. They're facing racism class for the chamber on Thursday and Friday. So it was an emotional um, and exhausting week, but um, it was a fantastic week for growth and learning. So. Well, thank you. I will add my thanks to not just you, but your entire department and 311, everyone who worked so hard to make the primary election a success. Um, I had a great meeting with the clerk this week and got a rundown. And I know you already are creating a list for November of things you're going to improve. And then we know that the uh, ballot in November is going to be a long one. And so we'll work again with the communications department uh, to do a no before you go campaign uh, to try to get ahead of it and make sure that people know before they get in that ballot box what's on the, what's on the ballot. So thank you. Thank you. All right. OK, so that will take us to our next presentation. So I see Rebecca Hoffman there. Uh, so Rebecca is here with us this morning uh, to talk about the historical, historical commission presentation on Keep on the Grass. So Rebecca, you want to come forward and um, share with us some information about this? Sure. Um, Bear with me for one minute to just be able to boast a bit about the Historical Commission. You may know that we now, um, we used to publish books uh, solely. And now we have, we've had a History of Grand Rapids website for 10 years now. And five years ago, we spun off another website uh, that specifically deals with the history of the furniture industry in Grand Rapids. And we're happy to say that we are averaging about 21,000 hits a month wow. on those webs, two websites. So that's a little bragging. I want to introduce Christine and Tom, Christine Byron, excuse me, and Tom Wilson, who, um, if not for them, uh, this book would not have been possible. We had been talking for um, a few years that we wanted to do a book on the park system, but as you know, unless you have uh, someone behind you to make it happen, it doesn't happen. But we had Chris and Tom, and uh, they helped us make it happen. And Chris is going to say a few words about that. Great. Thank well, you. Well, it certainly wasn't yes, just sure. us. Um, all of the historical commissioners worked on the parks book. Um, each was assigned a different park, and so it was really a case of us all working together. We got wonderful historical photos from the city archives, as well as from the Grand Rapids Public Library, and then some historical postcards as well. Um, we also had a couple people that went out and took contemporary photos for some of the newer parks that we didn't have historical photos for. So um, we're happy to give a copy to each of the commissioners. Um, we are so proud of our parks and, and the rich legacy that we have. And there hasn't been anything really done on the history of the parks since a little booklet came out in 1960. So we're very happy about that. The official um, book launch is going to be Thursday, the 16th. Um, the Friends of that we partnered with the Friends of Grand Rapids Parks, and they have their 10th anniversary celebration at their Green Gala this Thursday. So that's going to be the official book launch, and then they will be in the bookstores on Friday, on the 17th. 
So we hope it, um, you're pleased with it. We certainly are. Thank you. Thank you. This is beautiful. And I just wanted to add, if you notice, the book is dedicated to Charles Garfield. Yes. And it has the um, um, etching off his uh, memory stone that says, useful citizen, lover of trees. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Uh, and beautiful. they will be on sale if you would like more copies. Great. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. Thank you, thank you all so much. And um, I'll add my thanks to, uh, for your service on the Historical Commission. That's an important job and it takes a lot of time and energy and I know you give countless hours to that. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you for your support. Thank you, thank you. This is lovely, I'll be ordering many of these. <laughs> all right. That'll take us to our next presentation, and we'll uh, have our parks director kick this off. This is a presentation on the River for All, River Design Guidelines, and River Restoration Update. Good morning, Thank Mayor and Commissioners. David Markwart, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation. Um, today we've got a presentation, an update with you on the River for All Design Guidelines. This is a project that is in coordination with the Grand Rapids Whitewater um, Re Rapids Restoration Project work that has been taking place. Um, this is a partnership uh, with Downtown Grand Rapids Incorporated, Tim Kelly and Grand Rapids Public Museum. Um, our friends are in the back of the room there as well. Um, this is a, a, a split um, uh, process for all of us, um, ensuring that we are designing these river edges uh, in a way that are complementary to the uh, Rapids restoration work. Uh, so together we hired uh, Wenk and Associates out of Denver, Colorado uh, to work with us on these design guidelines. Bill Wenk is here to present uh, on behalf of the team and Richard Bishop um, is here to share an update on the, on the whitewater uh, efforts as well. So we'll start with Bill. All right, welcome, good to see you again. Good to be back. Yeah. Um, it's a great project. I'm, I know time is short. Uh, we, Richard and I, Richard Bishop and I have a number of images and I, I think of this more of a, as a movie rather than a slideshow. I'm gonna move very quickly through these. And if there are questions that you have about intent or content, um, please stop me. Uh, otherwise, if you could hold your questions to the end, it would be great. Uh, First of all, we're gonna very quickly summarize public engagement, uh, go through the Grand, Corridor, uh, the Grand Corridor guidelines and assessment. Uh, so much for going quickly here, sorry. Strategic <laughs> assessment plan. And then importantly, we're gonna talk about the opportunity sites because when the river is restored, uh, there's going to be a, a great deal of opportunity for uh, recreation that the city hasn't seen before. Before I do that, I'm going to turn it over to Richard here, who is going to talk about progress on the river itself. Well, good morning. Hello. Uh, good morning. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor, Commission, and City Manager for allowing us to be here this morning to give you an update on the river project. I think that uh, I, I, I bring, I think, much better news today than, than you've heard from the reports in the past, and that's a good thing. What I want to do is update you on permitting, uh, construction process, schedule, and funding. But before I get into those, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you how much I appreciate what the city's doing for this project. Uh, it's a true public-private partnership, and uh, not only from the funding perspective, but from the staff that you put on it, from Jay to Kristen to Michael and Jim Smulligan, you know, that's what makes projects like this work so well. And again, thank you uh, for putting that team in place. Uh, from a permitting perspective, you know, we have the, the times that I've been here in the past, we've talked about this uh, ha uh, habitat conservation plan. We're not going down that pathway anymore, and I have to say that's a good thing. Uh, we now are going down a Section 7 path, and, and the, good, the great advantage of that Section 7 path, it identifies a schedule that the federal agencies have to go by. So it's important that we do our job to get them the information, but once they get that information, the clock starts ticking. And I'll go over with you later in the presentation that schedule. So we're going down the Section 7 path for that reach from basically 196 down to Fulton. That will be the first project that will come online. The second piece of it is from the adjustable hydraulic structure, which is between Ann and Leonard, all the way down to 196. That will be another Section 7 process uh, that will be handled by the Corps of Engineers who have been a great partner with Great Lakes Fisheries uh, on this project. So they will, they will do the permit for that reach and then they will construct just the hydraulic stru structure 
and then Grand Rapids Whitewater and the city will come back uh, after that's done and uh, demolish the 6th Street Dam and put in the infrastructure from 6th Street Dam down to 196. Um, I mentioned that lower reach is what we will start constructing first and that will hopefully happen uh, sometimes in late July of 19 or early 2020. Uh, and then um, once all the permitting is done for, for phase two, which is that upper reach, uh, construction will start on the adjustable hydraulic structure. But again, on that reach, uh, the, the permitting process will be uh, put in place by the Corps of Engineers. From a scheduling perspective, uh, I mentioned how important the uh, Section 7 process is. We, uh, Grand Rapids, Whitewater, and the city are in the short throw of having what is called a biological assessment completed. Uh, that biological assessment uh, actually identifies the effect that we will have on the endangered species, which is the snuffbox mussel. Uh, how we go mitigate that, minimize and avoid everything that we'll be doing in the river to help with that. And then certainly uh, address uh, the sea lamprey escapement piece. So all that is included in this biological assessment. Um, we have a biologist that's working on that. Uh, we, we received the first draft uh, about two weeks ago. Our staff internally with the city and, and Grand Rapids Whitewater, we've been reviewing that draft. Um, the biologist now has our comments. She should deliver that draft to us in a final form somewhere around the end of September. And then a critical date is September the 3rd, which is a holiday. So September the 4th, um, if everything goes to plan and we do what we need to do, we will deliver a formal BA to the federal agency. Uh, the federal agency, uh, NRCS, will have about two weeks to review it. And then they will ship it to, uh, to U.S. Fish and Wildlife. When U.S. Fish and Wildlife gets that BA, the clock starts ticking for them to deliver a biological opinion. So they'll have 90 days to work with us to iron out any issues that they might identify in the BA that they want us to revise. And we'll have 90 days to go through that process. And then once those 90 days are up, they have 45 days to write their biological opinion. Uh, that end date is January the 28th. So that's another critical date for us. So January 28th, if everything went to plan, uh, we would have, which is a big deal, a biological opinion uh, from U.S. Fish and Wildlife that identifies that they confirm that what we're doing in the BA is acceptable or they might revise it and have some more requirements on us. But at a minimum, we will know what direction we have to head. And at that point, if everything goes to plan, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife is sort of out of the deal. Uh, so then we, it, concurrently, we're working on getting our DEQ permit in place to let the city revise that and review it so that we can start that process with the uh, Michigan uh, DEQ. Uh, we have a meeting set up with the DEQ on August the 28th to review that process and hopefully identify everything that we need to have uh, in our permit application so that that process runs as smoothly as, smoothly as it can. That being said, uh, if everything tracks the way we, we anticipated the track, we should have a biological opinion in 19, have uh, a permit from DEQ hopefully in late spring of 19, have a full permit, and worst case, uh, a permit best case we're able to get in the river working in 19. Now, there's a lot of pieces of this puzzle that have to align to get there. I think, I think we will have a permit in 19, but depending on where we, at what time we get that permit, kind of drives how much work we can get done in the river to where it's cost effective because of the seasons here. But that, as we track forward, we got the right people in place uh, to make that decision, but again, the, the, the message I want to deliver is I don't see any reason why we won't have a permit in 19 to, to, to do work. Whether or not we're in the river working is still questionable. So that's where we're on permitting. Um, Richard, can, yes. you, can you just um, clarify, though, <clears throat> when you say um, potentially next year, there's, there's different phases we have to go through, and, and um, the very first one being the mussels and the hydraulic barrier. And so, you know, I think when people here in the river, they may automatically assume that the construction will start on dam removal. That's not the case. 
there's a number of preliminary things that need to be done in the river before we even get to that phase. You, the Sixth Street Dam? Sixth Street Dam, yeah, yes. Yeah, so so what, what will have to happen is we can't take the Sixth Street Dam out until the adjustable hydraulic structure is put <coughs> in place. Uh, the schedule for the adjustable hydraulic structure is not absolutely determined yet, but I can, if I had to anticipate the construction, that adjustable hydraulic structure wouldn't start any sooner than 2020 right. because <coughs> it has to go through the permitting <coughs> process also. Um, and once it's built, then we can take out 6th Street down, yeah. down to 196. But 196 to Fulton, again, if everything goes to plan, it should be completed by June of 22. Great, thank okay. you. I just want to be yeah. clear about expectations that um, there's a lot of things in the river and that need to be done before there's any significant reconstruction. And then from a funding perspective, and you know, I have to say this is a very encouraging on the funding side. If you, if you look at the chart, if you look at all of our goals and the different agencies that, that are partnering in this process, um, we've, got, we've got commitments from everyone but Kent County and give you the update on Kent County. Uh, we will be at their finance committee on uh, uh, September the 6th, I think, uh, and we are very confident. And we, we've, done, we've done the same presentation to the county. Very encouraged by what we're hearing. We're meeting with individual uh, commissioners. And uh, so we'll go to the finance committee early September, and then I think September the 26th, it's, it's at, the, uh, at the commission table for a vote. So very encouraging. City of Grand Rapids is committed. DGR is committed. Uh, the state, we had uh, 1.5 million, we got in 18. Uh, they've already committed to the 1.5 in, in 19, so that 3 million is committed. And then the federal government, again, with the work that the city has done with the mayor's trips to Washington and the work that Steve Carey has done that we're all partnering with now, uh, and uh, Bob Lamb with US, uh, with Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, just a big success story there, and uh, I, I think that, that that those funds will continue to come in to get to that goal. So we'll, they will, then they've committed to building the adjustable hydraulic structure, which is a big deal. And then from the private side, uh, I think we're a little over 45 percent now, and we really are just kicking off our capital campaign. Uh, we have another big meeting in September, uh, so that's very encouraging. We're meeting with individual cabinet members and uh, making sure that we're getting all the contacts in place so where we can finish our capital campaign drive somewhere probably middle or late 20. So it's a very encouraging process, and again, you know, these projects, uh, these public-private partnerships are so good at leveraging public and private dollars to get community assets online. and. Uh, it's good for everybody that's a partner in that and uh, continuing economic development, building tourism, and making the city a better place. So thank you for this opportunity this morning. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be hanging around after, after what Bill gets finished. Thank you. <coughs> we've, we've been working over the past year putting to, together design guidelines for the river edge, not the river proper, but those areas along the river that are going to support in-river recreation. And really, our work's been an extension, an extension of GR Forward's public process. And it's been one of the primary goals of our project is to implement the very broad vision of GR Forward. So to that end, we've, and I won't read through the list here on the screen in terms of our outreach efforts, but it's been a great deal of public outreach where we went out to the public, art prize, other events, things like that. We have an advisory committee, focus groups, and a website. So we had a great deal of input. And um, this was the outcome. And without reading in detail here, people want to see more green on the river. They want to really restore the edges of the river. But interestingly, in contrast, they also want to use the river. Lots of use. That's all the purple. So. They want to restore it, but they want to use it. And it's striking the right balance there that is our goal in doing guidelines for the river edge. And this is all online. And like I said, I'm going to go fairly quickly through these slides. Stop me if you'd like to, to dwell on them. So as an outcome of that public outreach, we've put together a series of guidelines that, generally speaking, talk about corridor-wide guidelines that deal with circulation how to treat the river edge itself, how to be, make the river edge more sustainable or resilient, how to 
gain more identity, a higher profile for the river itself through signage and wayfinding, public art, history and culture needs to be, um, the river has such a rich his, history and culture, how do we bring that to the fore? And then importantly, how do we implement? Uh, to do that, we identified a series of site types and character areas that really look at how the river is both one entity and how it's very different. So how do we give it a uniform identity and connect it and how do we acknowledge and honor its differences? So looking at the corridor wide guidelines, I, I think there are a couple of key things. First of all, circulation on the river edge is so important and on the east bank we're proposing a high trail and a low trail that you can see in that center image there so that there is really very broad access for in-river recreation from the shore and vice versa. It's, it's really important in terms of recreation activity and safety. The West Bank is very different as you know. It's institutions and it's a concrete wall but that sort of connectivity is equally important so how the river trail connects through the west edge is, is equally important and dealt with in the guidelines. The red dots represent connections to the city and the plan and that notion of connectivity so that each area of the city can access the river easily and safely is critical in our thinking. That came out in the public process. West side, other neighborhoods say we can't get to the river. Make that an important part of the plan and I'll get back to that in a minute. Then we have a whole range of different edge types along the river to deal with um, greening the river in the upper left image. Um, how can we activate the river edge in along the private areas, the, that red square P1, and I'll come back to that. And then current trails quite often are, are underwater. How can we make those more usable more times of the year? Identity. Uh, we have a recommendation for different types of signage and wayfinding so that you you can find the river trail easily as a resident or a, a visitor. Also, how can intuitively you just know you're at the river? So we talk about uh, welcome mats, this sort of blue paving at major entry points, uh, crosswalks, and then breadcrumbs, that notion of different things that just say, oh, yeah, yes, I'm at the river. Uh, if you've been to Indianapolis, the, their historic trail there, it's easy to follow. That notion is what we're bringing forth here. So now I, uh, I want to just briefly touch on the different site types and character areas. Site types are those very broad categories that tend to differentiate between public and private ownership. And with each in, each of the site types, there are different character areas. For example, in parks, Riverside is very different than Butterfield. So we talk about those differences within those broad categories. Or uh, also in the private sector, the west side of the river, the old industrial areas that are tending to revitalize uh, north of 194, very different than the Market Street site, just because of scale of site, if nothing else, and river edge uh, conditions. So uh, what I'm going to do now is walk you through some screenshots of different pages, uh, dual pages within the guidelines. The document itself is at this point, I think, about 150 pages. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of detail here, but just give you a sense of what the different site types cover so that you, here you can see Riverside and Butterfield and the different character areas or, or the different concepts that drive the thinking there. Uh, moving on, in the, in the private sector, the industrial redevelopment areas, these are really kind of the economic drivers, the, the, the where activity along the river, I think, can really be a, a boon to the city from an economic standpoint, can incentivize developers to do the right thing on the river edge. You see some examples from Brooklyn and from Milwaukee here that I think really get to the character that we're suggesting there so that we encourage the developers to do things with the, with the cross-sections that 
uh, you saw earlier. Uh, public riverfront parks, these are really going to bear the, the brunt of the activity that will come to the river. Uh, again, broad concepts for Canal Street and, and those sites to the north, great deal of river access, but it's very different than the, the number two sites that you see, which are the museums, museum sites, but they're both very public and they function in different ways that are covered <coughs> in the uh, character areas. The urban riverfront parks, again, it gets back to that notion of how do we make the river, quote, hard so that you can accommodate very large events and activities that complement what might happen in Rosa Parks Park, but that are at the same time soft. So we, we talk about seating on the river edge of this, you, so that you can accommodate those major sporting events, kayaking, festivals and things like that, but at the same time they're very flexible open space that can accommodate the thousands of people that you see now on North Mon Monroe with movies on Monroe already. It's not even a park yet and that level of use is occurring. How do we accommodate both the softness of restoring the river as well as, as that sort of level of activity that I think is, is uh, out there already? Uh, then the guidelines cover those components, the site furniture that visually tie together the trail corridor along both ed edges of the river. <coughs> Things like railings, for example, are key so that we have that sort of unif uniformity. Paving and surfacing. Uh, we have a whole family of different types of paving that we're suggesting for private development and for public as well, public parks. Uh, we also have one of our consultants doing a strategic asset management plan because, as you know, if you can't maintain it and if you can't man manage these parks, and this is a big undertaking for the city, but it's also a tremendous opportunity as a regional and citywide resource. Uh, if you can't do that, they're, they're going to have problems. They're going to fail in certain ways. So we're looking long term at uh, levels of service for the different character areas that I've already described, a maintenance forecast in terms of cost and management strategies. So that's currently in process. Uh, and in each of those different character areas, we're talking about levels of service. And I won't go through these in any detail, but obviously, the red ones, which are the downtown parks, the uh, Fish Ladder in North Monroe, for example, the existing promenade, um, the, the parks, Canal Street, and the new parks to the north, those are going to be very high maintenance because they're going to have high levels of use. So they're going to cost more. The co cost of maintaining and managing an ur urban park are, are, you know, multiple times more than a typical city park, for example. Whereas Butterfield and Riverside, you know, especially Butterfield, those natural areas, those aren't, those aren't going to cost as much. So we're really looking at those different levels as part of the management plan. And then it goes into a great amount of detail. Um, I won't try to get into detail in terms of these charts. I'm not good at charts to begin with like this, but for example, the, the blue line, which is paving and furnishings, cost very little at, once they're installed, but as they age, they, the costs increase to the point you replace them. And that's that sort of kind of peak to valley, the high peak to valley, whereas plantings, and this plan will differentiate between trees, for example, lower maintenance, and kind of turf and flowers and things like that tend to be higher maintenance and more cyclical. So it gets into a fair amount of detail. So there'll be costs for, in very specific ways, different levels of service and for different pipe types of improvements along the corridor. The maintenance and management um, will include looking at what might be maintained in-house by parks, that might be maintained and managed by DGRI, and what might be might require a new type of management structure because it's just not, uh, the challenges just, just aren't met by what we 
what the city currently has. Uh, but the key here is to anticipate that rather than uh, wait until there are problems and then you <clears> have to fix it. So uh, I'll keep going. I'm going to switch now to going through the opportunity sites or five sites along the river that we're looking at that will be developed as parks or improved as part of work that Richard's group is going to, de that Whitewater will do. These sites are all used as river access during the construction. So they're going to be torn up to different levels. Some of these are, aren't touched very much, but for example, North from Monroe becomes a major access point for, for river improvements. And um, you can see the different uh, sites that we're looking at here. First of all, the public museum, uh, our focus has been to really look at that edge between the building itself and the river as to how we can make that much more useful. Uh, we see interpreting the history of the site and the, the canals that drove the mills along the river as being a major in, er, interpretive opportunity in terms of water feature. So that notion of environmental education and education about the city's history. Um, formalizing a small amphitheater that now occurs on the site. Uh, a place for kids to hang out before the school groups go into the museum. And importantly, I think, gathering areas along the river edge, a, um, and I'll flip forward here, the triangular, brown triangular thing, an outdoor dining area off the cafe that will be developed as part of the river, uh, the museum expansion, and then to the right of the, of the carousel, um, more along Pearl there, a terrace that would be used, for an outdoor terrace for receptions and things like that. So gaining a lot more use that really support the, the mission and the activities of the museum itself. Um, Colebrook site and Canal Street uh, boat launch area. This, uh, according to GR Whitewater, becomes a, a really important point potentially for launching uh, in-water uh, kayaking and rafting groups. Uh, and Richard can attest to the popularity of these facilities, of in-river facilities of, of rapids and rafting and kayaking once they're built. So um, knowing that um, redevelopment is part of the city's desire for Coldbrook, we're suggesting that that middle site, the, the park site between the existing building, the, the water treatment plant building, which would be redeveloped, be maintained and preserved so that you can have large volumes of, 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 of concessionaires that bring boaters in here. There can be literally hundreds of people and lines of buses that are dropping off in river boaters, waiting to get into boats, learning on how to not drown in the river if they fall out and things like that. So it, I could talk about an experience I had in Colorado recently. I won't do that in the interest of time. And then it still leaves a, a site for redevelopment as well. Also, that notion of environmental education is really important on this site. We're uh, proposing that the outfall to Coldbrook Creek actually be daylighted as an opportunity for environmental education for programs that would be housed in the in the building. The repurposed water building um, has some great potential for uh, possibly a, not only interpretation, but parks department uses, uh, maybe crafts related to the river, canoe building and things like that. So it's a big building. This is not the entire building shown here, uh, but I think there's some really exciting possibilities that connect the indoors and outdoors to the river. Uh, equally interesting is the water storage site. Um, we've been intrigued with how we might repurpose the water tanks as a unique destination. Uh, un unlike anything else, the, the woods along the river, the kind of low area that floods, you've seen this before, I think elevated trails through the treetops. But the key here is this, this is probably one of the more important points for river access. It's where the, the adjustable dam is located and 
it really becomes a community or a, a regional facility. Uh, this is where a lot of people will enter the river. So here's a better image to explain the circular thing. It looks like Bill, a... Um, Commissioner uh, Moody has a question for you. I'm sorry. I have a question after I'm spilling my coffee up here. Um, and everything is fantastic. I just want to ask the question, is there any place in your plan for fishermen? Yes. People who enjoy yes. fishing. He's getting to that. I've already seen this presentation. Okay. So, oh, okay. uh, great, great, great. Yes, great. The, uh, and I will, I will assure you that um, individuals from the, the fishing community have been actively engaged um, in this conversation. Uh, and, and even in regards to, to this site, Bill, you may speak to the, to the um, engagement with um, folks from the Native American community. That's right. This is probably one of the more important points for anglers, we think. And they'll work their way downstream, especially in low water. But that's the whole notion of the low trail on the east side of the river, that you can literally get into the river almost at any point on the east side of the river. Canal Street, Colebrook. You said off a canal? I'm sorry? You said off of Canal Street? Canal Street Park, yes. So that whole edge becomes much more accessible to the degree that we can put a low, take the existing wall out and put in a terrace sort of series of trails. Yeah, I asked that question because I have a lot of friends who go down to the river to fish, especially on Sunday mornings. So I wanted to make sure they had a spot down there somewhere that they can find <laughs> a place to be comfortable at. Yeah. Are you going to go down there with them? Not on Sunday. Not on Sunday. <laughs> another day. Another day. <laughs> okay. Um, no, you can see that the big lawn there and the kind of gradual slope down the, the area at the, at the river. Uh, I want to point out the co collapsible d dam on the lower left corner. Uh, so upstream you have flat water. The, the, uh, the uh, portage is, is that area along the edge on the, on the right edge of the river. Uh, a, a very large playground, uh, amenities for, for kids. Hopefully winter use would occur here, uh, cross-country skiing through the woodlot and the natural area to the north. So we really think it can function year-round. Uh, areas for, uh, for ceremonial, use, ceremonial use for the, the, the First Americans, uh, we had that discussion with them. This is an important site to them. So I think a lot can happen here that means a lot to different communities within the larger communities of the city. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Kelly may be interested in um, the water tower and the conversation about potentially using that as an event space for weddings and events. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but thank you. <laughs> we have a wedding advocate in parks uh, on the board here. <laughs> we have serious questions about the structural uh, the structural issues related to taking the top off of the tank, but let's let's dream a little bit, and if it doesn't work well, we tried. Yeah, yeah. It's a cool idea. It could be one of the most interesting spaces in southern Michigan, I think. Uh, um, North Monroe, we see as being a major sort of venue for large events. For in-river events, it's it's at the rapids uh, where all the in-river Boating competitions will occur, uh, probably <coughs> somewhat secondary to fish ladder, but uh, just large open spaces that can accommodate. Uh, the edge is designed to act as really an amphitheater edge, and different terraces going down to the river to accommodate very large groups. The kind of the music festivals that have been occurring there with the tent fits on the upper lawn. Uh, also, the notion of activation daily is important. There's been desire for a skate park in the downtown area for a long time. That could occur under the viaduct. Um, the, uh, the lower portion right along 196 there uh, is an important takeout point for tubers and kayakers, so we're accommodating in-river activities. Um, Let's see, what have I left out? So I think simplicity and flexibility really is the byword for the development of North Monroe to complement other spaces that you have in the downtown. And here's a, an aerial image of, of it. Uh, 
and wrapping up, uh, fish ladder. <laughs> it's probably the most Im important spectator site for in-river competitions. So we really focused on preserving the existing fish ladder structure, which is a great sort of icon for the city, and expanding the river edge viewing opportunities and river access there. And you can see in the image on the right uh, how there are a number of points where you can get into the water there, including the existing uh, boat launch area. Um, unfortunately, we, we just started this uh, recently. We don't have a sketch like the other one that's coming, but that's the end of my presentation. Love your questions, comments. Thank you. Um, maybe, Bill, to, to add, Tim, I don't know if you were planning to speak or not. Uh, thank you for being here. But um, I, think, I think maybe a, a good addition would be, be an update on the conversations happening at DGRI, DGRI um, and the commitment of that board to look at models for long-term sustainability. And that DGRI is um, taking the lead on starting to have some of those community conversations now that we have some of these planning processes and some of this visioning done. Uh, can you just speak to that a little bit? I, I know it's a priority to a lot of people, especially as we look at increasing community engagement and people around the table as we look to long-term oversight and, and maintenance of the entire river corridor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, yeah, so we received the same presentation at the DDA Board last week. Um, obviously very supportive and encouraged by all the work and thought that's gone into this. The main questions that continue to come up um, from DGRI and DDA um, um, kind of surround this maintenance question. Um, and I think we're really encouraged to see this, the strategic asset management plan that's come out of this and the thinking behind that. Um, I think we all get the vision and are supportive of it, but we know that with new improvements, with implementation come additional maintenance costs um, and responsibility. And so we're very interested in understanding, um, you know, how that's going to impact the overall operations of the corridor and thinking, um, you know, Bill mentioned at the outset, but thinking about how this is going to get managed long term uh, and really just going through a process to determine what's going to be best for all of us, um, both from the city, DGRI, Whitewater, um, and, and thinking, you know, looking at models from across the country, um, but just thinking about how we can make sure that once this great amenity and asset um, becomes what we all think it will, that we're utilizing it to its full potential and that's, that it's here for the long term. So I think that's kind of the, the high level of what we're hearing and we're encouraged and looking forward to going through a process to identify what's going to be best for, for the river corridor. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I just want to highlight that that process will, as Tim said, uh, include looking at best practices and other models. And then we as a community can decide um, what we think is best moving forward. Uh, again, there's a lot of work still to be done, as, as Richard said, before we're in the water. Um, but we want to start that conversation now, especially after the great work that's been done by uh, the River for All team, which there's a number of the team members there in the back. I want to thank you for your incredible work um, on, on this planning process and visioning, really. So thank you. All right, Commissioners, any questions for um, Bill, Richard, David, or Tim? Commissioner? I do have a funding question. Um, if we can go back to that slide. I don't remember the exact dollar amount, but I'm curious to know where the federal funds are coming from, which department, are they grants, and a little bit more details oh, about those dollars. One of them is from uh, Foreign Ops, and the other one is from the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission's partnership with the Corps of Engineers through EPA. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the two areas that the money is coming from. So are those dollars sustainable, or are, we, are those one-time dollars? No, well, actually, the funding f for the adjustable hydraulic structure uh, is coming in... Uh, it's, it's sustainable in the sense that it's been set aside, but it's coming in upcoming years. Uh, the Great Lakes Fisheries is already holding about four million of it, mm -hmm. and 4.5 of it will come next year. And so over the next, and that's why when I mentioned it was be about 2020, but it's in the budget and uh, all that's moving very well. And then I also mentioned that uh, this again with the city's partnership. Uh, working with a delegation from, from uh, Great Lakes Fisheries Commission, helped get $8 million into their budget to deal with sea lamprey across the, across the Great Lakes. But a part of that $1.8 million goes to this project. And mm -hmm. so as long as that money is in the budget, that $1.8 million will continue to come in too. So it's not grants. It's, it's uh, sustainable funds. Now, 
as you know, things happen in Washington, mm -hmm. but uh, everything is looking really good to this point. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, city manager, this is a question for you. So the two million for the city, the city's contribution, is that um, two million over? What's the length of time for that over amount? Over five years. Five. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just add um, <clears throat> that the the a significant amount of the federal funding will go for the capital and the building of the hydraulic barrier. Okay. Yeah. All right, Commissioner Park. Yeah, I just want to say thanks for reaching out to the Anishinaabe community and getting their input. And I was pleased to see some of their ideas incorporated here. I've reviewed their full list, and they've got some really important um, information for us to consider as we roll this out. So I just wanted to affirm that and thank thank you for that. And I'll be watching for how that gets incorporated into the plan. Commissioner Kelly, did you have a question? Well, just again, I want to thank you all as well, the whole committee that's been working on this for such a long time. And remember how this all got started with residents who came up with this, Chad and Chris, and um, really appreciate their their input. Very thankful for the co uh, comments on the asset management plan because, you know, we've certainly been down that road with our own infrastructure here. And I know you've con talked about different ways that we can um, put together a conservancy or some form to oversee this whole project, so appreciate that. And then, of course, I think you are well aware that we're this body is hoping to see as much um, opportunity as possible in the building of this from our local contractors and minority contractors and women contractors. So just a huge thanks for how far we've come along and it'll be very enjoyable to watch this as it moves forward. Thank you all. Um, Commissioner, I'm glad you brought that up uh, because we've had a lot of conversations about that and I think that's why it's so important for us to look at our own internal procurement process and bid discount and for us to have that conversation because the, the contracts for this project will come through the city. Mm. Uh, and so it's a huge opportunity and we're, we're already in the midst of, of having those conversations, but as we've said around this table and fiscal committee has really taken this on, mm -hmm. we need to, to take a, a much deeper dive into our current policies and, and really strengthen them um, as we think about uh, this project especially. Yeah. Any other, any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Appreciate your work. Great update. All right, commissioners. Next, that will take us to, I see a topic that is um, also aligned with, with that conversation around procurement, and that is um, the work that the Economic Development Department is doing around uh, an equitable economic development strategic plan. So as you all know, we talked about this during um, the budget. Uh, it was, there were, was funding allocated for this project, knowing that it's a, a really important thing that we take on as a city, and also that it was one of the recommendations that came out of CARE's work with the Rose Center Fellowship. Uh, and it was one of their, I think, 12 recommendations that we had from them. So I'm going to turn it over to Kara just to let you know some of us um, have been privy to this presentation because Kara presented it at our recent Economic Development Project Team meeting. Uh, so Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Rapart were in that meeting with me. So Kara, thank you, and I'll turn it over to you for the presentation. Thank you. So again, to reiterate what the mayor said, this um, comes as a result of your strategic planning session in December. And um, the work called for a comprehensive economic development vision and plan. In addition, transformation plan phase four calls for departments to complete a strategic plan that um, incorporates the um, following five elements. The racial equity lens, measurable key, uh, key performance indicators, outcomes and metrics, lean processes, and alignment with the sustainability transformation and fiscal plans. In addition, I want to um, highlight the, the fact that the work done around the neighborhoods in focus has been um, impactful. And most of you know what those consist of, but um, the Kellogg Foundation did some work to identify that 32% of the city's population resides in these 14 census tracts known as the neighborhoods in focus. And this is also 50% of the city's poverty. That area has lost population. They have the largest concentration of persons of color. They have the highest unemployment rates and the lowest educational attainment rates, among other things. And we know our future is going to look different. Our changing demographics are also a component to consider as part of this. In addition, um, there has been some work done around the um, 
city contracting of public services as it relates to park streets and sidewalks. And we believe that the applicability is transferable to the public investment being made through the economic development incentive programs um, that result in construction activity and new employment or housing opportunities. In addition, the economic case for equity is such that um, our MSA, our um, GR Grand, uh, Grand Rapids, Wyoming MSA, would add nearly $4 billion of GDP growth if persons of color participated in the employment sector and were equal, equally compensated with whites. So this is a remarkable opportunity for growth, and how do we pursue that? So while we think that the programs alone can't eliminate disparities in our community, the opportunities certainly exist to advance racial equity through our strategic planning and policy making. So that's what we're pursuing. A five-year comprehensive strategic plan to advance equity would be our goal. We would RFP for a consultant team to assist us with this. The focus would be in five pillars specifically, the business development um, climate, the real estate development area, neighborhood business districts, or our corridor improvement district authorities and bid, innovation, entrepreneurship, and mobility, noting that equity spans throughout all of those. Equity isn't a separate pillar. It has to be embedded in each of these pillars. The strategic plan would be built upon existing plans, some of which are adopted and others that are relevant or pending. <laughs> Engagement. So as part of the process, we've outlined some of the components, convening a steering committee to facilitate a mission, vision, and value session, having a current state analysis done to identify our current state of economics here in the city so that we build a plan based on what's realistic, seeking input from residents, elected officials, the public and private partner stakeholders, uniquely done through an equity-centered design process on each of the five pillars. In addition, we'd want to align regionally with stakeholders such as the Right Place, Kent County, Michigan Works, uh, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation, and the Michigan uh, State Housing Development Authority on topics of housing, workforce development, talent, mobility, and business development, because those are matters that are much more impactful at the regional level as opposed to something that could be solved here locally. Components of the process would include an analysis of the baseline economic conditions, a SOAR analysis, strengths, opportunities, aspirations, and results, identifying and removing barriers, identifying the short, medium, and long-term goals and strategies to achieve them, KPIs or key performance indicators with appropriate benchmarks that are realistic for our economic conditions, and recommendations to deploy and develop resources to achieve those goals. And this would be a five-year plan with SMART goals and tracking mechanisms so that we could report back. The objective would be to benchmark our performance against aspirational cities or competitor cities. This is our opportunity to be bold as a city and set our sights on being the best mid-sized city in the US with a vibrant economy that is inclusive in its growth. Identifying an implementation plan with measurable tactics, defined targets, and a reporting structure with a focus on data-driven decision-making and continuous improvement is key. So the deliverables would be a plan. We also would, would seek a program or project evaluation process map that's tra transparent and predictable for investors, infographics and a dashboard template to communicate electronically on the website, and the key performance indicator reporting mechanism as well. So here's an opportunity for you to share with, with us the goals that you have, the expectations, any questions that you might have about the process. Um, we would like to know what you believe would define success in this process. All right, I'll turn to my colleagues. Commissioner Leonard? Yes, so Kira, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm really happy to hear that you all are doing this work, and I know you've shared some of this um, at um, our Southtown SID meeting. I'm curious to know, and, and how opportunity zones mm -hmm. will tie into this and um, is it possible city manager and mayor for us to get some type of a presentation on the opportunity zones mm -hmm. we keep having questions and um, even members of our staff aren't necessarily equipped with responding to them I personally don't feel like I'm equipped to respond to them I know <laughs> it's new I know there are a lot of unknowns about it 
But if we can do some form of a presentation, even through this process as you're engaging the community, because I think they are tied together at some point, but even if we could have some presentation at this table, just so that the community can be aware of what that is and what it means for our city. Yeah. Good. Commissioner, that's a that's a, a great recommendation. In fact, last week I saw a couple folks from MISHDA and asked them if there was any update on Opportunity Zones because a lot of cities have questions and the federal government hasn't been uh, really helpful in understanding uh, the potential impact, but also the role of local units of government. I think that's a big question mark. Yeah. Uh, so, Kara, would you follow up on that? Sure. Probably? And I can tell you that a lot of the guidance from the federal program has not been issued yet. It is expected this fall, though. I did hear that recently. But know that it'll be another tool in the toolbox, like the low-income housing tax credit that's you know administered federally and statewide. So I think it'll, again, be a tool in the toolbox that we'll consider. So I wonder if there's a way to do some one pager of what we already know and, yes. then, and then share with people that in the fall we'll have more details as they become available. Yeah. That'll, that'll at least help us to communicate something between now and, and fall. The yeah. other thing, um, back to your goals, I think <clears throat> we've talked about this a couple times and especially a couple years ago during the budgeting process where um, when there was a new position created and I'm forgetting the title, I think it's an analyst position, but when it was created in, in the department, we talked about the roles and responsibility of that position and, um, and talked about this body having a, an understanding of what our expectations would be for that position um, so that then it can inform. It was a new, newly created position and it was like many um, positions when we're adding them was a point of um, um, robust discussion. And, um, and I just, w one of the components to the position was tied to being available to existing and um, starting businesses as a one-stop shop so that if I'm looking to launch a business, I can go to this person or in this department to be able to get all of my needs met, even if that's helping me to know how to navigate um, um, government local or you know county or state just having the tools available to any business owner and so i want to revisit that conversation um, i know our immediate focus was to make sure that the sids and bids had the support that they needed and now i think kind of expanding that to make sure that we're including that component where engagement is happening um in in on a level where newer business owners and existing um, businesses will know where to go and so a part of that will probably be some campaign of informing them that it's available and then talking through what supports are necessary. So I don't know, you know, at what point, but I think that would be something that if, as we're talking in the community about this or the department, I think that would be a really good thing to try and um, garner some feedback on. I know that in our CID and Chama has done a really good job at helping um, the business owners in our CID to kind of know and navigate. And I think it will be a really good thing to have it formalized so that everyone then can be aware. Great. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And it, it should probably be in partnership with um, what Lou is doing in the development center with the business um, uh, but Yeah. <clears throat> and what AJ is doing. AJ is doing. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. just all of that, just trying to figure the whole thing out so that businesses will know. That's, that's an excellent point. point. Maybe that's right for um, an assessment and to see if that's the most efficient or if maybe it needs to look different. We'll add that to the list of the new city manager. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner? Yep. Thank you, uh, Kara, uh, for your uh, for your presentation. I, I'd, I'd like to make mention of the fact that I, the there was a, a presentation that took place last Tuesday uh, by Alyssa Davis, the Bloomberg Fellow, and I think it very much underscores uh, what we're talking about on this morning. It was uh, it's it's one thing to hear um, the data. It's a whole other thing to actually see mm -hmm. the data, mm -hmm. and when you see the disparity, um, it is both. Uh, uh, Heartbreaking, and it's also uh, it speaks to the the level of of urgency that we need to engage in to really address this because uh, I think in order for us to keep down the path of wanting to be a world class medium sized city, we've got to you know find a way to be intentional about trying to get at that and drill down at that issue. And the 
uh, Alyssa did a great job with the you know with the uh, very sobering um, data, but I also but, but again it just speaks volumes about it, and it just makes it I think clear that we have obviously a lot of work to do, but this is the way in which we need to engage. We need to be very intentional, unapologetic, and really drill down and trying to get to a place where we can see some um, you know some moving of the needle around uh, equitable economic development. So. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Kelly? Yeah, I just wanted to comment on <coughs> Commissioner Lanier's um, comments about the opportunity zones and our need for a better understanding, and then the opportunity, too, to, through the Legislative Committee, to be proactive. I mean, I've, we found that with the state, if, if we come up with suggestions ahead of time, we may well be able to have some influence there. So if we better understand it, then we can yeah. better respond and, and be proactive. And then I'm just thinking that, you know, we just had this huge conversation around marijuana. We are going to see some income coming into the city. Again, these are opportunities for us to figure out how, how does that play into this in a way where we might have more control than otherwise. So I don't know how we will decide, but I think that's got to be part of the conversation, too, on how to use that, that those income tax uh, earnings. Yeah. Commissioner? Great work, Kara. Um, I just want to say that I appreciate equity being at the front and center of the plan. Um, to me, that's the goal. That's my expectation, as well as how I think we're going to define success. So uh, if we've got a five-year plan, we can measure how we've done on that, and that's super important. And I also just want to affirm this, this idea of regionally looking at things like housing and mobility, because um, our, our surrounding jurisdictions need to join us in that equitable work as well as that work around affordable housing, workforce development, and, and wages. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, any final comments, Commissioner? Yeah, I, just, I, I appreciate the work. I, I, you know, I sound like a broken record sometimes when I talk about incentives, but it's, it's you know, we have, <clears throat> we have to be mindful when we do this work that we use the right incentives to try to incentivize the right things. Mm -hmm. And so some of the some of the incentives are competitive and limited in scope. And some of the and so we don't have a lot of control over them. Sometimes I think there's incentives that are essentially unlimited in, in scope and so trying not to reduce those when there is no cap on them. And and then ultimately ensuring that, you know, we don't have incentives for some of the things that we wish we did. And so I think that's probably the most important thing is we live in a very boom or bust uh, way in which the incentives work for affordable housing. You know, we get a LIHTC project is really the only way you get a affordable housing development. And we get one or two a cycle, so three or four a year, and that's great. But we've lost the ability to do the things in the neighborhood, the things like small market tax credits, things like historic tax credits. They're the things that really move the needle in, in incremental scale that uh, actually probably have a longer term impact on revitalizing our neighborhoods and neighborhood business districts. So it's, we think we need to be more intentional about uh, you know, advocating for uh, access to things like that in Lansing and then you know, ultimately how we do prioritize some of our, uh, the tax credit we, we're allowed to, to access from the state and how we prioritize them. That you know, while we appreciate the large scale projects, we also need to have some understanding that uh, we need to be more intentional about targeting them to smaller projects as well to give more opportunity in uh, in other places in our community. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you. Any final comments? All right. Yes, I do. Um, Commissioner? I, I had the opportunity to meet Mrs. Davis and I had a nice conversation with her. So Mrs. Wood, thank you for the, the report. I wanted to get to the luncheon, but I couldn't because I had previous engagement. But I had a nice talk with her and then she was able to give me um, the opportunity to read a report before you guys got it. Um, <laughs> and, and like Commissioner Jones, my heart was a little bit uh, deterred, uh, especially when you're looking at economic development in a particular area where the areas are not growing. But I think at this point in time, there is, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And from reading the report, the community engagement is going to be a very important piece. And we have to find the individuals in the community who want to develop economically, and there are individuals out there that just need some guidance. So I think it's important that we take the report and we make the report become actionable. We already got the data. We already know what's going on. Now it's time to do something about it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before us on the screen, our next steps. So um, Kara will take the lead on this. And um, Kara, remind us timeline. When do we hope to issue an RFP? So we hope to our, our 
issue an RFP within the next couple of months. Um, we're working with our partners to review this information, the other boards and authorities that will be part of this process. In addition, we will be presenting Alyssa's report at Economic Development Project Team. Um, that data will serve as a foundation for this plan going forward. Great. And we'll continue to provide updates at Economic Development Project Team. And is it reasonable to think that we'll be able to move forward on the actual planning early next year? I would hope so. Hopefully okay. even later this year. Okay, great. All right, thank you for your work on this. All right, commissioners, uh, it's 10.42 and we are getting to our action items. So we, I, I know we had a, uh, a number of presentations, that's why the briefing afterwards was canceled. Uh, one of the reasons I should say. So we'll get moving on this because, uh, reminder, we also have Economic Development Project Team at 12.30. We have a work session on street infrastructure at 1.30. And we have a performance review with our city attorney at 3. Do you want us to reschedule it? We'll talk about that in a minute. So let's get to um, our action item, which is item number four. This is a resolution scheduling a special meeting of the City Commission to be held on August 28th uh, at 6.30 p.m. for the recent Third Ward Commissioner Nathaniel Moody to affirm the oath of office. Support. Support. All right. So hopefully everyone will be there and we'll have a little party before a 7 p.m. meeting. So. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. <laughs> all right, next that will take us to a resolution approving a request for Commissioner Moody to join all of us in attending the MML conference, which is taking place here in Grand Rapids in late September. So moved. Support. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. Um, commissioners, by now you should have received an agenda. There's a lot of great workshops. Um, and then also information on the opening reception. I hope all of you can attend that. Um, and. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Laura. She's been coordinating this out of my office. So Laura, thank you. All right, next that will take us to a resolution approving artists and venue agreements for Art Prize 2018. So moved. Support. All right, Asante, you wanna tell us about this? Hello, thank you. Uh, so every year uh, in partnership with Art Prize, we do these hosting agreements. This facilitates the event and um, makes it uh, possible so the city and the artists that are on public property or in the public right away know the responsibilities. <coughs> so I'll, I'll leave it at that um, and turn it over to TJ and uh, Jolie who will give a brief presentation about some of the art that's going to be a part of our prize this year. All right, wonderful. Welcome. Hello. Hi. So I won't take up too much of your time today. Thanks, uh, thanks for having us. We're really excited about the projects that are coming to the city this year. Uh, my name is TJ Matthew. I'm the public projects manager for the 2018 uh, season for our prize. And, and uh, my name is Julie Kirkikis, and I am the exhibitions assistant uh, for our prize. Um, so really, I just want to go through some of these projects. So feature, in, uh, quickly, Feature Public Projects is a granting program that was started in 2016 to help facilitate bringing large-scale public works to the city, temporary uh, large-scale public works to the city. Um, and we have a few, uh, a few projects going in this year that we're really excited about. And then I'll also briefly touch on our mural program, which is temporary murals that go in um, at different locations um, on uh, shipping containers. Um, so here we go, briefly. Um, so this, uh, this project, the, the World Beneath the City, is going in, <coughs> excuse me, uh, at a, a, novel one, a novel one Park. Um, it's going to be six giant red crocodiles. Um, they're going to be kind of moving across, moving across the park um, in, in, this, in this formation. Um, and it'll be really nice for um, families and kids to come visit. Uh, they'll be able to kind of climb on them and interact with them in that way, which is pretty exciting. Moving on, uh, this is going to be on Gillette Bridge. It is oscillation. Um, it's an interactive installation with light and sound. Um, four and five crystals um, in different sizes. They're made from um, uh, essentially plastic, uh, U uh, ultra high molecular weight plastic, so a durable, a durable plastic. Um, and those go on Gillette Bridge. They uh, are <clears throat> have the theremin devices on the inside that when um, people go up to them and, and interact with them, they make different sounds based on how close you are in proximity to the sculpture. So those will be pretty, pretty exciting. 
Um, this is our site plan for that. Um, a few of them will kind of just go along the entire span of the bridge. In the past, we've had projects that are in the are set centralized and in, are in, in the center of the bridge, and we're excited that this one is kind of spanning the width. So there will be something to see as you move across from the from east side to west side and into a Nabwan Park where the where the crocodiles will be as well. Just another uh, image of that for you all. As you can see these are, are, are quite uh, are quite big. Um, there'll be a nice presence there. Um, this piece will be in Calder Plaza. It's by Gustavo Prado, um, titled Stream. Um, <clears throat> pretty. Ex it, it's always really exciting to me to see projects that are simple with their materials, but have a really a really nice presence. So they're they're easy to set up. They're easy to maintain. And they're you know relatively easy to take away, and this is a, a good example of that. Gustavo's piece really does that uh, very well. Um, and this is kind of our layout for Calder Plaza. So the footprint is um, is is quite big, not not too big, I think. But um, it'll be really exciting to see people move through this piece. It's um, just cinder blocks and and convex mirrors, so you'll get a lot of nice reflections um, in the mirrors. Of, of what's a, of what's surrounding the area, and uh, this piece has been used has been set up uh, not this same formation but in diff different formations um, multiple times, and it's really great to see people interact with them. Um, lots of selfies happen, <laughs> which is which is pretty exciting, um, and it gets yeah it gets people really excited about being being in the area. So this is Gustavo's piece. Um, <clears throat> this project by Slow Architecture that is going into the river, um, Harvest Dome 3.0, another iteration of this one in, in New York City. Um, and this is going right off of Anabawan Park. Um, it's made from recycled, uh, recycled seat belts, rear-view mirrors, and floats on two-liter soda bottles. Um, so we'll be putting this in on August 28th. We're working with MDEQ <coughs> to get um, permissions for the, for the river, and we've been working with Jay and Asante and the AAC have all been really, really fantastic um, getting, getting these projects to prove and helping, them, and helping them move forward. We really couldn't do it without them, so always appreciate all the help. And this is John Suave, Man in the City. This will be on the Blue Bridge. It's a seven-foot die-cut <laughs> steel, <laughs> die-cut steel <laughs> man. Uh, uh, this is our insulation area right there on the left-hand side. <laughs> Yeah, and there will, there will also be other, John is working with um, different businesses in the city to have um, smaller die-cut steel men placed either in proximity to their to the businesses or potentially on the top of buildings. This is, um, if you have uh, been to Detroit recently, there are some of these on top of buildings there, and they're really, uh, it's really awesome to go around and see them as you're driving around, kind of a nice um, spectacle around the city. Uh, moving on to murals. Um, for Gillette Bridge, this is uh, Shana Castellan's mural. This is um, not the one that will be installed in the city um, on the shipping container, but um, just kind of a finished product <clears throat> to show you a difference from her uh, proposal, which is the next slide. So this is her proposal that was that was approved by our president AAC. Um, this will be so each each uh, shipping container gets um, a, a mural on on each on each side. So this is one side, and then the other side is is here. And Brian Lacey is at Calder Plaza. These are the designs that were approved for Brian. There will be um, a similar similar colors to the the first slide, one side and the other side. And then Patrick uh, Hirschberger. Patrick was a uh, art prize artist um, in the past. This is a, one of his pieces that was outside of uh, Van Andel. And this year he is doing um, Club Indigo. He has done work on uh, historical um, moments and things in Grand Rapids. So he's focusing on yeah, this Club Indigo that was demolished in 1991, but um, had been a popular establishment since the, since the 30s. Um, and he does some fun stuff with characters. So this will be one side, the interior of Club Indigo, and then an exterior shot. That's uh, that's it. Thanks for uh, thanks for having us. Yeah. Great. Thank you, um, Commissioners. Any questions, Commissioner Kelly? Um, is this available on your website? The slideshow. The slideshow is not available on the website. I can um, I can make it available to you if you'd like to review it and see it. Um, all of the. All of the artists are are on are on the Art Prize website, but not in this not in this format. So you'd be able to look them up and see their pieces, but it's not going to be like like this, like you I, see here. I mean, and if it's okay, we 
yeah, share absolutely. it because absolutely. people will want to come. This is some pretty incredible art. And I also wanted to say it would be awesome. I know we want to get ourselves on the map and keep ourselves on the map. Other cities are copying this. If we could have some information about the science be but behind some of these things, like the the um, on the bridge, why why the sound works the way it does, and the music and so on. There are a number in here that I was think looking at through the lens of teaching science. If we could have some information, that would be another real bonus for families to come down and have their kids understand how this all works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can talk with some of the artists and see if we can get some of that information for sure. Yeah, I know there. It's like, how do, how do these things happen? You yes. know, it's, got, it's, it's very yeah. magical. And, um, uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. What a fun year. Yeah, thank you yeah. so much. Looking forward to it. All right, so commissioners, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. All right, next that will take us to a resolution authorizing the Breakaway Music Festival to be held August 24th and 25th <coughs> at Belknap Park. So moved. Support. All right, Yvette, you want to tell us about this? This would be the second year of the Breakaway Music Festival. Yes, absolutely. So uh, this year, a lot of planning has gone in, into this event, just like last year. Uh, last year, the economic impact was $1.3 million for this first-time event. So we were very excited to have them back again a second year. This year, we've increased some street closure signage in the Belknap neighborhood area. Um, Google Maps has changed the Belknap Park address so that uh, cars, Uber, and uh, Lyft will deliver people to the base of the hill and not at the top of the neighborhood. Um, we're continuing to advocate for walkability and different mobility options throughout um, the event weekend. Uh, uh, the event organizer, Chris Meyer, has worked with Noble. Uh, he met with them back in March. Uh, they're notifying their uh, members. Uh, they're doing posters, flyers, neighborhood notices, yard signs, um, and they're also going to do a pizza party the day before the event kicks off with the neighborhood. And uh, they're going to get free tickets, tours, uh, and just really make sure that the neighborhood is aware of what's going on and what to expect. Great. That's wonderful. Commissioner's questions? Just a huge thank you, mm -hmm. Vet, because last year I think maybe I got one call about it and that was it. So, I mean, the, the work yeah. that's gone into this mm -hmm. between you, the staff, Belknap, is incredible to have so many people coming into that neighborhood and, and not get any complaints. And then it would be great if we could find a way to get some of those proceeds to pay for those stairs because they're in such <laughs> bad shape <laughs> up the hill. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thanks. <coughs> Wonderful. Any other questions or comments? Nope. All right. Well, thank you so much. We're glad to have them back. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. Thank you. All right. Next will be a resolution establishing an industrial development district for Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing for a project proposed at 524 and 528 Butterworth Street Southwest. Can I get a motion? So moved. Board. All right, so uh, commissioners, we heard about um, Graham at our public hearing um, in this request. It's a great company over on the west side. Uh, Kara, anything you want to add to this? Just that it's a very significant investment um, by a locally grown company and a lot of great paying jobs and the type of work we want to see here in this, um, this area. All right, questions or comments? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, it carries. The next one is a companion item, and this is a resolution approving an industrial facilities exemption certificate for the same company, Grand River Aseptic Manufacturing, for their project at 524 and 528 Butterworth Street. Well, support. All right. Anything to add? No additional comments. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? It carries. All right, next up will take us to a resolution approving a contract with West Michigan Environmental Action Council for the 15th annual Mayor's Grand River Cleanup and Rain Barrel Program. So moved. Support. All right, and Mike Lunn is here to talk to us about this. Good morning, commissioners. I got delegated up to. Carrie was sitting here waiting to cover it, but she had to go to another meeting. All right. And that meeting's about some of the work we're doing along the Grand River, so she had to go. All right. Um, so this, again, is the... Uh, annual mayor's cleanup it's september 8th yeah. and a continued participation in creating where uh, rain barrels rain barrel workshops to give knowledge about rain and storage thanks thanks mike so hopefully all of you will come join me for a morning cleaning up the river uh it's lots of fun we're 
<laughs> heavy boots or rain boots because it's but, also and, and kind it's of muddy and messy. Over the years. More and more <laughs> communities uh, participate and do things along with it, so it keeps getting bigger and better. It is, and uh, just so you know, uh, our neighbors, uh, so the Mayor Moss from Granville, Mayor um, Pohl from Wyoming, and Mayor Heisinga from uh, Walker join me, and so we kick off the event, and then we all join a group of volunteers at a different segment of the river, and then we come back together at the end, and typically there's music and lunch and a beer tent, uh, so you can uh, have a nice refreshing drink after typically a warm, sometimes wet, sweaty <laughs> morning. <laughs> Doesn't that sound fun, Commissioner? <laughs> <laughs> well, last year I was in the third ward cleaning up uh, gutters, and that was uh, and, and alleys. That was a lot of fun. Uh, so anyway, all right. Any other questions about this? You can sign up on the WeMiac webpage uh, or get more information from my office. All right. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, it carries. Thanks, Mike. Tell Carrie, thank you. Okay. Oh, you're up next, too. So next item, uh, Mike Glenn can stay right up there. It's a resolution to amend Ordinance Chapter 33 called Pole Line and Duck System of Title II of the Code of the City of Grand Rapids. So moved. So moved. Support. All right. Mike? So, Commissioners, we've been working with the City Attorney's Office, Tom Forsey, to develop this ordinance to clarify um, some of the rules and, and things that go on within the duck bank system that we manage. Um, we have customers within the duck banks that if our rodent chews through a piece of wire or fiber, they expect us to fix it for them. Or there's misdig accidents that go on and their, their fiber gets cut or something. Again, they come back to us even after they file a misdig ticket saying that they don't have anything in the area. So this is just a clarification to current practices that we've worked with the city attorney's office on. And this just sets it up for a public hearing in two weeks or three weeks. So. Great. Commissioners, any questions? All right. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? It carries. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. All right. So um, next conversation, uh, night number 12 on our agenda is consideration. And I would say it's really a, a follow-up to our work session last week. So last week, we were all together for a little over three hours talking about a number of public safety issues. From that conversation, we said we wanted more time to take a deeper dive into the information that was presented to us because it was quite significant, as well as we wanted time to really think about uh, some of the considerations that the chief had brought forward. Uh, and so that's what we're doing today is we're following up on that conversation. Do you need me? I am after this. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? Uh, All right. Bathroom break? You need a break? No, could we do that for a couple minutes? Yes. yes. Does everyone need a quick break? Yes. Okay. Chief, Thanks. three minutes. Sure, we'll take yeah. a quick break. Warm up our coffees. <laughs> we have been going at it for uh, a couple hours now. So. Or one and a half, I should say. It feels longer. Um, so, Commissioner is back in here in just a couple minutes.
that it? What are we missing? Just O'Connor? Yeah. Oh, sure. John Swan. John Swan. <laughs> Start calling him that. <laughs> All right. Is, did Nate just run to his office? Yes. I think he's just white picking. Oh, yeah. Several days. <laughs> just in case. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, Chief. Good morning, Mayor. Good Commissioners. morning. Uh, to your point, Mayor, this is a very succinct. Uh, capitalization of the conversation that we had it was about three and a half hours of what we're looking at regarding potential community and police relation in investments so I'll touch on the the high points uh, there are seven of them we discussed adding six potential community policing officers to the schedule a staffing study a comprehensive staffing study to include <coughs> administrative training and detective personnel we discussed an expanded crisis intervention team model. We've been using that model for years now, but looking at expanding it deeper uh, and throughout the agency. We discussed um, completing the violence assessment for cure violence. We talked about GVSU doing a study regarding best practices to include additional violence um, interruption programs assessments. We discussed protocols for benchmarks and metrics of those programs. And we closed out by discussing carrying the unencumbered balance um, of this year's money that was previously earmarked for improving police and community, and, and community relations into next year's money. So any unspent monies would be available for next fiscal year. So I want to start by thanking everyone. Um, last week's three and a half hour meeting, extremely comprehensive. The questions were on point and well informed. I think it was very beneficial for the department to hear your issues, and I hope we uh, did a good job answering your questions and concerns. So what we've provided you today is basically what you directed us to do, and I recognize you may have questions concerning specific items, and I'm here to answer those. Great. Thank you, Chief. Um, I will open up for questions, and um, and I will, I'll go ahead and start. Um, Chief, and, and again, not that you need to do this today or urgently, but I would like maybe in the next couple weeks um, a little bit more detail about our current um, detective unit mm -hmm. and, and the structure and the number and some data if you have it on if we are um, backlogged, maybe even a, a little bit of a historic perspective right. over the last couple years. Where were we? Where are we today? Is it worse off? Why? And what potentially some solutions are? I know you talked about um, really looking at the cases and moving some of those to um, the interns and I, I would like a, a just a, a better understanding of that if possible. So it certainly mayor uh, coincidentally this morning at our 830 staff meeting we met with detective division personnel to discuss how cases are assigned to look at opportunities to redeploy some of those misdemeanor thefts to take some of that workload off of our detectives who, by my opinion, are currently or more, um, assigned more cases than would be best practices. Having said that, we can give you a, um, a quick turnaround on the number of cases detectives are carrying, the turnaround times on cases that are assigned, but I think um, most significantly will be the overall comprehensive staffing study. To your point, detectives an important role and capacity, but how that fits into the rest of the department in terms of the reports that are generated that require follow-up, um, I think a comprehensive point. study will be important, but we will get you the information uh, quickly regarding the number of detectives, the historical perspective, cases, uh, caseloads currently, and as opposed to caseloads in the past. Great. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I asked, I've, I've just heard that a couple times, so I want to just better understand where we are. Well, it's a, it's a great question because between family services, major crimes, general case, uh, detectives, uh, to their credit, uh, work extremely hard. I do have some concerns that the caseload is greater than I would like it to be in terms of getting the best return on our investment and maintaining the health of our employees. Great. Thank you. Um, so I think I'll start. Um, Commissioner Part, did you have your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah, so I just uh, want to thank you again. That was it was a, a really impressive three and a half hours of, of information. 
And, uh, you know, I continue to be weighing a couple of things. One is, how can we give support to the, to the department to honor the extra work that they're already doing and also alleviate some of the staffing strain that, that you know, that they're experiencing? But then also, how can we utilize this funds? We only have a million dollars. A million dollars isn't going to fix, you know, the problem. But how can we use them to innovate in ways that are going to truly enhance that relationship between the community departments? So I want to achieve both of those outcomes. And I heard from a lot of people after Tuesday. And uh, then I was intentionally about reaching out to some Latino leaders in the first ward. And all of them said we're really open to, the, to these recommendations. And then they, but there was a general consensus among all of them is that if the 21st century task force is going to lean on staffing and deployment as their next point of discussion, why wouldn't we allow them to do that? Uh, along with this, uh, this study that's going to come out, or the study that is, the one, is actually <coughs> item number two, that would tr truly show the gaps. Um, because, you know, to my first point, I want to fill the gaps, and I don't know if, I'm not sure whether or not six community police specialists would, would actually alleviate the strain that's feeling. So I want to see that and, and be able to evaluate that against uh, the data. Um, and then I also am interested in, you know, Mark Washington isn't going to walk on water here in Grand Rapids, but I, I looked up online over the weekend, and uh, in 2016, they, com they just completed a, a very, very, very extensive community policing study. And uh, if you go to their police department's website, all of those 21st century recommendations around data, you can find it in Austin's website. You know, so I do think he's going to bring a lot of value. And I, but I will say this, because their city commission is voting this week on adding 100 officers, uh, because that was the recommendation of the study. And so we are absolutely we're absolutely going to have to reckon with that, um, because I'm I'm almost positive that that study is going to come back and affirm an what we hear anecdotally from your department. And so I think that Mark is going to bring a lot to that discussion. I'm very, very interested in that. To the other six things, I think that they're all things that we should move forward. Uh, the one thing I want to add is that the contract with Grand Valley, um, I think that, uh, oh, let me get my notes here. Uh, I have three things that I discovered over the weekend that I think are, that I would love for them to research as well, that are evidence-based things from around the country that are more on the behavior health side and kind of jail de deterrent um, strategies. So right now we've really only discussed cure violence as a commission, as an evidence-based practice. So if Grand Valley is going to do some research for us, I'd love them to look into these other three things that I, that, that I, I was made aware of. Um, so that's the, the only thing I wanted to add on the rest. So I, uh, what I heard from the community is they're very much open to this, and, uh, but they wanted to see these other things happen, and I think that there's some wisdom to that. Uh, but I also want to say up here, I think that we are, we are going to have to reckon with staffing with the, within the department. So um, that, that is coming online as, as you look around at what happened in Austin is just one example. Commissioner, do you want to um, share the three other, yeah. just just so that we, uh, the rest of us, know what those are and we can look into them a little bit our, ourselves as well? Yeah, so uh, one of them is um, is kind of a, is a jail diversion, pay for success, kind of focusing on housing and behavioral health, and that's in Denver. Uh, there's, in Chicago, they have a wellness and triage center, which again, these are jail diversion tactics. I think that one of the best ways to in, improve community police relations is to say, I could take you to jail, but uh, I'm not going to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do this other tactic. And that's in Chicago. And in Denver and Chicago, that's, and we've discussed this, but I think that there's a model of it is pairing social workers with patrols. So I had an incident up in the second ward, um, and Barry Bryant got dispatched to the scene and was amazing and spent an hour with a woman who really should have been, you know, he, he, did, he did everything that he should have done. But the woman went to the hospital the day before. They released her. She's back out on the street. She's having a manic episode again. Dispatch can send, they can hear, when I called, they could have heard that it was really not for a police officer in some respects. Now, Barry did a 
Officer Bryant did an awesome job, but he also spent an hour of his time, and then another car pulled up, and when they could be doing other things. And so I do think that, particularly when we think about resourcing too, I think that the hospitals and those and those other mental health folks could help us with money. To, you know, how can we turn this million bucks into three? <clears throat> and I think it's going to be linking with those kinds of kind of things. So I can forward this on to, to the rest of the commission. That's if great. you could share that with, with me as well, yeah. Commissioner, we'll yeah. start to take a look at those programs. Uh, to your earlier point, I completely agree that six officers, six community policing specialists will allow us to do some of what we do during the day in the evening, but it's certainly not a solution to our overall staffing issue. Austin's about four times our size. They're adding 100 plus officers. Yeah. I'd be surprised if a consultant didn't come back and say that we're 10% lower than we should be staffed and adding 29 officers would be a recommendation. I think a commitment that if we're going to go down the path of a consultant study that we're also committed to following those recommendations <coughs> as it pertains to manpower. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair. Yeah, thank you. Others who wish to be heard? Commissioner? Yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, obviously I've been advocating to add more officers, uh, community policing specialists especially, and, uh, you know, if this comes down to waiting for recommendations from 20 NCP, then I can't spend any money out of this funding on any program until we hear the whole report, if that's going to be the validity of the argument that you're making. And uh, the idea that we're going to need to hire some more officers, most likely, if, if it takes a year or more to figure out how to do that, and we know that it's challenging enough to recruit uh, officers to do the job and to try to build the um, diversity into the police force, I think we're foolish if we don't start that process now. Because if not, we're just, again, kicking the can down the road and we're waiting longer to try to do this. And if the recommendation is, at some <coughs> point, two officers or 10 officers or zero officers or 100 officers, um, we still know we need to recruit more people for the next class and try to build our, our force the way that in the, in the new and innovative ways that we're doing it. So, I, again, if we're going to wait for 21 CP, then, you know, I'm going to come back to that. We're going to nickel and dime this money away uh, here and there. And if it comes back that the recommendation is to hire officers, you got no money to do it anyway. So um, it's, it, it's either we spend the money how we agreed to or, you know, seemingly agreed to on uh, last Tuesday, or then I'm, I want to just put a pause on all the spending from the fund and, and, and hold off. To your point, Commissioner, it is a good reminder that from the point you give us the green light to proceed, it's the better part of a year for us to hire, train, and get those individuals out in the capacity where they're working solo and contributing. Um, Chief, and maybe this is more for Eric, in the information shared with us, are we missing an option? Because wasn't there an option in the A3, which I left in my office, unfortunately, to allow some additional funds for overtime to free up time for evening and weekend hours am i nope that, there was an option in the a3 it was two hundred fifty thousand dollars, if i recall correctly to provide some additional <clears> support <throat> right now but also give us some more time to work through some of these recommendations and finish up the work well we talked about that during the work session and i think there's a trade-off so officers are already working a fair amount of overtime and so having them work more overtime is counter perhaps to what we're trying to accomplish. So could we do it on a short-term basis, perhaps, but I'll let Chief talk about that. But it, there's a, there is a trade-off to doing that. Oh, I, I recognize that. Um, but, there, and, but to your point, there was that recommendation. And it would, um, what, and the whole idea of that was we've tried not to have officers train in overtime because it's very expensive. So, um, which means that we've trained on straight time, which means they're training during duty time. And so what this would do would be allow more duty time by having officers then train on overtime. Okay. You want Got to see this Commissioner? Oh, okay. thank you. Did, okay. Commissioner Lanier, did you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say thank you, Chief, and to your team and everyone who presented um, last week. And um, very robust and detailed presentation. Um, to <coughs> Commissioner O'Connor's point, I think it's valid um, that, you know, we may nickel and dime with the various recommendations so i think you know it would be good to kind of go through some of the recommendations to talk about which ones you'd like to not move forward with if if we're not in a position to make a decision today i will add i think um i am interested as well commissioner Rephart, to hear what our new city attorney i mean excuse me city manager would have to um, <laughs> <laughs> make it a nervous right 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 <laughs> 
um, what our new city manager would have to um, share and the feedback he'd provide. Um, I just think his human resources background, I think his labor relations background will help him to understand this scenario and not even knowing that they recently had gone through some study and, and had recommendations that they're implementing in, in Austin. So I, I think the mayor, everything that has been said, although it sounds like some of the comments are in opposition, I'm very supportive of because I think the mayor's point about evaluating um, um, the detective unit and the workload that's there, I think is another valid concern. And, and so just trying to understand comprehensively where we are, and I think you know you have a, a, a good point about if we go through a study, then we need to be prepared with what the outcomes will be. I don't think that every study you implement every single outcome, but I do think that if you are going through a process that you should be prepared for whatever the outcome should be. So I agree with that as well. Um, but I am concerned that um, if there is a greater need in other areas within the department and we're making a decision about what seems to be the area that's getting the most attention, right. that are we doing a disservice to the department? So, you know, if, if my aunt's um, home was broken into and, and because of backlog through the detective's unit, um, that isn't being um, investigated, but someone is, um, you know, out in, in the community playing baseball with children, if I'm weighing those options, I think I would want her to feel safe in her neighborhood and having her investigation closed would be the priority that I would look at. And I think um, the lack of knowing all of those scenarios and issues that we're experiencing within the entire department is giving me pause about saying yes to community police um, specialists at this time. Although you probably know that I find value in that and I've, and I've shared that. And so, you know, I don't know how we can hear more um, because we're hearing about the detective unit, but what are the other units that we're not hearing about? And that, it's, yeah. That's a point well taken, Commissioner. The need for the six uh, additional community policing specialists doesn't diminish the need for additional detectives and additional first responders assigned to patrol. So right. um, I think a comprehensive study, staffing study, uh, to be done as quickly as possible. Uh, and it can, there can be a quick turnaround. I wouldn't recommend us doing it internally. The internal benchmarks that we would use, the officers per thousand, um, which hasn't really been accepted. Um, for good reason. The model that we've discussed is the 60-40 in terms of officers having time that is um, based on calls for service and 40% of time that is based on proactive patrol and community engagement. Those metrics require um, some actual work in terms of putting the numbers together, it requires some CAD data, some RMS data, they actually look at weather patterns and then they make recommendations. So I've looked at other reports, not something we'd have the capacity to do externally, but mm -hmm. there are some very good individuals with good reputations who do it externally. And I think if that was our intentions to do that, we could get a quick turnaround. So what's, what's a quick turnaround? I think we put together an RFP in, in a matter of weeks and close the process relatively quick. And I think 90 days uh, to 120 days for a turnaround on that study is reasonable okay. um, because the vendor would go into it with the RFP stating that that is the expectation. Okay. And then, so to Commissioner O'Connor's point about kind of pressing pause on some of the other things, I, I think that we are trying a whole lot right now. Mm -hmm. And I would personally like to see us um, master some of the things we're implementing to see how effective they've become. And um, so what are your thoughts about pressing pause on some of the other recommendations as we go through this 90 or 120 day bidding and, and implementation process with the study? Yeah, uh, that's a great question because my thoughts are that we need to close out some of our current programs before we go down and start um, pursuing other opportunities. So we've got a lot on the table. Um, personnel literally are, are taxed, I think, to the point that we now have overtime that goes unfilled where we have overtime offerings, which is pr a premium rate, but it, uh, officers choose not to work it because it's, we've, we've reached the point of diminishing return. So to answer your question, I think before we pursue new 
or explore new opportunities. I think we need to close out the ones we're currently pursuing, decide what the return on our investment was, and if we want to continue with those investments or pursue new opportunities. So, and I don't mean a hog, Mayor, but just want to get clarity. So, um, a couple other questions, follow-up questions. Would the study include um, deployment and, and the strategies for deployment and even recommendations about how dispatch helps or um, interacts with deployment decisions? And then would it also include um, scheduling? Because as I was mentioning before, you know, that's a concern for me, uh, an 8 a.m. start time for the com community police specialists. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm hoping that that would also be included in the RFP. And then um, the other element that we talked about last week was if, if a decision is made to have this type of a position created, which I don't know if the commission wants to get in the business of directing a department that specifically, to be honest. Right. Um, I don't know how many other departments we're saying we want this specific position um, listed and posted and filled in this department and and i don't want us to treat the police department <laughs> like we're not treating the other because i'm Fair about on. equity yes. and that's an equitable so but in, in the event that it is a um, cps if we decide to do that do we i want to make sure that there are measures in place so that we can secure whatever those positions are because i wouldn't want the transition that i think i heard happen before um where they transition from being a community police specialist to um, SRT. And I, I also want to make a comment. Last time I talked about SRT, and I want to be clear, I wasn't saying it negatively as much as I was just saying um, it changed into a different kind of job description. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm going to grab your last comment first, if I could. Um, to your point, uh, Commissioner, we recognize that there's a lot more discussion when it involves public safety. And, uh, but we recognize the spirit that that's done in. Uh, obviously, people in the public, uh, the community we serve, interact much more with us uh, than they do with others, than with other departments. The nature of our assignments and our roles, I think it's very important to get this direction from policymakers. So we recognize how that input is, is delivered and the importance of it. Regarding the scheduling, the staffing and deployment study can cover just that, both the level of staffing and how individuals are deployed. Once you get into scheduling models, we start talking contractual issues. Uh, the schedules are dictated by contract. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the timing is good and that we're getting ready to start contract negotiations. If that was a topic that both the union and the study recommended a fresh look at, I think that could be done. But I think the staffing and deployment would be instrumental in our first step. Okay, and I, I do think that that should be a part of it because I think the flexibility in a contract is going to be valuable as things are changing. So there was a time when we had five day a week, eight hour shifts. Now we're at 12 hour days. And so as times change, things may need to change as well. And, and scheduling is probably one of them. And I think as the makeup of the department changes, I think that's being more, become more of an issue internally. I, I think some of the uh, officers who've been there a long time prefer the current model. Mm -hmm. um, I, I get a sense that maybe some of the new hires and people or people looking at, at us as an employer uh, may prefer different opportunities in terms of scheduling. So I think that will be an important discussion to have. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Kelly next. Yes, thank you, Chief. I really appreciate your um, openness to the conversation that we had last week and, and overall your openness to just the transparency, the conversations you've had out in the community and with us. Well, thank you. And I look forward to continuing those. I think maybe we've not had enough recently just because we've had so many other big issues to deal with, you know, getting a city manager and the marijuana issue and so on. So apologize for that. but. Um, I, I agree that it would be great to do these uh, comprehensive staffing study that that ought to probably be the best practice moving forward. No, no model is perfect. We've read all about those and the upsides and downsides, but it's certainly recommended as the best by ICMA and, and the COPS folks too. And I'm sure that, um, that you would agree that that is ideally the best. It might be a little more expensive, especially a first time go, going around, but hopefully a lot of the work you've done with the CALEA work has already will will be data that we can use to make those decisions. I think um, partly I'd also love to look at uh, some alternative delivery systems as has been mentioned in some of those articles where for example and I heard this in conversations with our neighborhood groups too because they're feeling the the tension between 
the desire, you know, obviously they love the community policing that we do, and where they have access to an officer, but they also recognize that times have changed, conversations have changed, and we need to be sensitive about that. But one of the, um, one of the um, organizers was talking yesterday who'd read this information about having 911 do all of our uh, non-emergency calls, and I think we've moved in that direction. Excuse me, 311, yes, important. <laughs> To, to free up officers, because one of the, uh, yet another organizer was the one who brought to my attention or asked for information about this, what the city charter requires of us in terms of budgeting, and it's that not less than 32% of the general operating funds shall be appropriated for police services. And we are currently at 43%, and the question that came up to me is how do we live within that budget? And of course the budget certainly has grown because our city's grown and our income tax base has, but the only idea that I can come up with is, is given the fact that we are looking at likely having to hire more would be this alternative delivery system. So I'd love to look at those options as well, whether it is, you know, how do we get more non-sworn staff involved. And I think that there's some healthy dynamics that can happen in that too, if you have some civilians within the department so you have another perspective from the community. It's it's looking at almost like we would diversity, diversity of thought, diversity of of reactions. I often think about how we commissioners will go to our city managers and say, well, this is what we're hearing from the community. And they don't always like to hear what we're hearing, but our goal is to provide that honest feedback so that we can create policy that is, is really healthy. So I see some real benefit in, in thinking through that delivery system. So just like Commissioner Lanier said, asked the question about deployment, can we also look at what's out there in terms of best practice with alternative delivery systems? So uh, at our three-hour meeting, Commissioner, you asked a great question. You asked about the concept of community policing. This gives me an opportunity to reiterate Although there are officers who wear the community policing specialist <laughs> title, yeah. you're right, it, it's a mentality that pervades the department and, and really is about everything we do. It, it's in our DNA. That being said, um, pairing civilian with sworn, there are a lot of models out there that are proving successful. Com uh, Commissioner Repart, I think, is the ones that he's looking at, some of them I'm familiar with, and some of the models that I've looked at also make that recommendation. The challenge as I see it is just that they always pair a sworn individual with a non-sworn because oftentimes the line between what will require law enforcement intervention or police powers versus what a civilian can do um, is where the rubber meets the road. So while I think pursuing those opportunities and looking at what is out there in terms of mixed models of delivery service is a great um, avenue for us to proceed. I think it's important to remember that most all of those that I've looked, actually all of those I've looked at, do require a sworn presence to coincide with that non-sworn uh, capacity as well. Okay, I know we do some of that already in terms of abandoned vehicles and so on, but there are several examples here um, following up on traffic accidents and so on, and so I'd love to look at that. I also agree that we do need to push pause just because of the volunteer hours that are we've all asked our uh, task force to put in and I know that they are now in that process of looking at community policing and deployment and I would not want to jump ahead and then we'll hear from them like you know we're doing all this work and you're not going to pause and listen and then I think that there are other groups um, not just the neighborhoods that we all meet with once a month um, through our support from Stacy Stout but also um, other groups out in the community that can help define what community policing is that can give us input and that we ought to be listening to. We started out, you know, listening to Link, for example, with a 12-point plan, and we've been working our way through that. So I didn't, I wouldn't, I'd just love to hear or have you get input from other commissioners around this table about who those groups might be. And then finally, um, I do not want to press pause on cure violence because we have just were engaged in the assessment and want to at least move forward with that. I know that there are other models now that Commissioner Reppert has brought up that we should look at, but uh, you know, to put another gap of time in there I think would be a mistake, recognizing that there are other reasons 
why we might want to push pause on the six officers, including the fact that we around this table can't make that decision. We have heard numbers from 6 to 12 to 15, and then today 0 to, to, to 100 officers, and so really we don't know. You're the experts. We can get in expertise to help us figure that out. I think we need to be humble enough around this table to know we don't know, but we need to know. So I'll, I'll take that opportunity to weigh in with from what I've looked at in other places I've been in from what I see. So uh, this is my fourth budget cycle. And my first three years, I asked for 10 additional officers, 10 additional, and 10 additional. I, I think we're at 10% below our, our ideal staffing level. I think 330 would be a healthy staffing model for us. And while I don't expect us to get there in one fiscal year, I think that would make some of the programs that we've been exploring sustainable. <clears throat> so while I think hiring a half a dozen and earmarking them as community policing specialists would be a step in the right direction, I think as the city has grown since the economic downturn, as we become more vibrant, as we look at, alternate, at our opportunities along the riverfront that are conceivably draw thousands or tens of thousands of visitors to the city in ensuing years as we discuss the marijuana legislation that is uh, going to be upon us very quickly and the potential legalization statewide and the additional traffic that that will bring to the city. So I think the commission is being very wise in taking a very holistic long-term approach at a situation that hasn't developed overnight. Um, the city did what they needed to do to get through an economic downturn that was unprecedented. I uh, did a great job in doing so. Uh, I've never seen a more lean organization. And to the credit of the men and women in the department, they've managed to maintain the service levels. But uh, I, I am saying that I think it's, the timing is good for us to take that hard look and be now very strategic moving forward to ensure that type of success in the future. Well, Chief, I really appreciate that, and, and especially you're talking about how we manage through the recession. And other than staff, I think only Commissioner, former Commissioner Bliss, now Mayor Bliss, and I were around when we had the recommendations of a group called the Transformation Advisory Committee. Transformation Advisors. Transformation Advisors, and I don't know how many, there were 20 some folks around that table. And it was, we were at a very critical juncture. I mean, it was survival for the city. But I don't think that this issue is any less important and might actually require that same sort of deep dive where we employ the services of folks around a table like that in defining what community policing is and in looking at how do we live within the budget because the fact that we are at 43% is concerning when we are trying to address some of these other systemic changes. So I recognize the need, but I also recognize the tension, and I would hate to ever go through another downturn because we are in these peaks and troughs like we've never been, and now that we're in, in a global economy where we have to lay people off to the extent that we did. So I want to just be cautious about that and maybe <coughs> consider something similar to the Transformation Advisory Group because this is no less important an issue with the biggest department in the city. Thank you. Commissioner Jones, did you have a question or comment? Yep. Uh, thank you, Chief. Um, thank you in particular for last week for the information provided. I, uh, I, I will say that um, uh, per my uh, statement on last week, I, I still am in a place of um, not being ready to support the addition of, of six officers for the stated uh, duty of serving as uh, a community police specialist. Um, and I got a couple of reasons. One is, uh, as has been mentioned throughout the morning from colleagues, I think there's wisdom in hearing what a uh, third party assessment or analysis will bear out in terms of the overall need for the department, uh, whether it be additional officers in the detective unit, traffic, or whatever the case may be, and recognizing that we're going to have to make uh, very tough decisions uh, at that time once we find out where those positions are needed and where those dollars are going to come from. Um, I, I do think that it, would, it, it is a, a bit premature for us to move forward in the space of community policing based on the fact that, as mentioned, we haven't heard from uh, 21st uh, CP, or the, I'm sorry, the Policy and Procedures Task Force. Um, and beyond that, I think that uh, 
you know, the inclusion of or the addition of six officers in that space uh, ultimately uh, won't get us to where we need to be in terms of efficiency around uh, our policing in our city. Um, I also think that in the grand scheme of things, and I think you've alluded to this as well, uh, Chief, that you know, when we're talking about community policing, it really does come down to uh, really working toward it being a system-wide or department-wide uh, mindset or mentality, and not just something that uh, six plus officers within the department would, would, would bear that title and would work within the confines of, of, of community policing. But what is it, what's it gonna take to engage the entire department to take up a mindset and recognize the benefits of community policing as a whole? Um, I believe that what is needed is uh, just a wholesale or a, a greater focus on overall culture change for the department. In my conversations throughout community, uh, in all three wards, uh, and with, with people of all hues and uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, I think people see the value in um, committing to culture change as a whole and recognizing that in many ways we're in, we're, we're in uncharted waters simply because of what's happening throughout, the, throughout our country. Yet we don't want to penalize you know, our department um, based off of what's happening in the national scene. Uh, but I, for one, I, I will tell you, Chief, and we've had conversations about this before, um, I can't help but to think about um, what has happened in the recent past and how that speaks to uh, perhaps people's perception of our department. Um, I think about you know the incidents of 2017 uh, when we had uh, you know young people, young African American children in our community who uh, were traumatized, and um, I know you don't take that lightly, and I especially don't take that lightly, and. I don't, um, I don't think that there is an easy answer to that particular um, experience and making sure that we don't have that happen again other than, you know, the, the, the training aspect, but also, again, this real commitment, this sense of urgency and having a culture change so that the entire department recognizes the importance of seeing people's humanity regardless of the color of their skin or the zip code or where they live in the city. Um, and I'm not blaming you, I'm not blaming the department on where we are as a culture and a, and a, and a country around policing. But it's something that we're gonna have to, you know, swim through and, uh, you know, walk through that terrain together. And I'd much rather do it together than separate. And I just think it's going to get, um, it's going to get more difficult before it gets easier. And I think that, I don't think it's too much to ask for, uh, for patience and for uh, trying our best to do this thing right based on the fact that I do not want us as a city to experience what we experienced in 2017 if we don't have to. I just, I don't want that, man. I don't want, I don't want to be the, on, on international and national news for that reason. And so um, I am, again, very hesitant in, you know, green lighting an effort that would fund uh, community policing um, in, in many ways in a vacuum compared to the need to do it system-wide, so. So to your point, Commissioner, um, I'm confident that, that if we were to identify what our number one priority has been in the last couple of years, um, not only is it ensuring equitable outcomes for everyone, regardless of how they look or what zip code they live in, but even equitable experiences. So uh, through our training, through our hiring, that has been our priority, and, and that is running throughout the department. Uh, we recognize the urgency um, of that and how important that is in terms of our credibility as a profession and, and, and how that touches each and every member of, of this city and, and how... Um, it's got to be our, our number one goal. That being said, um, I guess what I don't want us to do is wait for the perfect solution and let small incremental steps um, 
be pushed aside. So at the risk of sounding, sounding contradictory to my previous uh, input, while I think a holistic, widespread angle and lens and exploration of the staffing is important, I would encourage us to have the conversation about adding people in the interim is not necessarily a bad step particularly if we're um, earmarking them as community policing specialists, because the input that we do receive uh, throughout the course of the day, weeks and months from our, na our neighbors and, and people in the neighborhoods is that they appreciate the relationships that they have in the daytime. To your point, I agree that that mentality needs to carry through everything we do and everything we touch. So it's a difficult discussion. And once again, I agree with you that it's probably going to get more challenging before it gets easier. But we've got the right people in place. We've got the right elected officials. We've got the right community leaders. And I think we have the right people in the department. Um, so I'm going to go to Commissioner Modi and then back to Commissioner um, O'Connor, but also want to share information that our city attorney just provided me, just so everyone is aware. Um, on September 11th, um, the team from 21st Century is going to be back in Grand Rapids. They'll be doing a presentation before the full city commission with an update. And then they'll be having their final meeting and community gathering on October 5th. So just so you all know what those dates are and that we will be getting, we as a body will have more time with Ron Davis um, and the team, but then also we'll be able to um, wrap up those final recommendations in the next um, six weeks. So I just wanted you to have that information as well. Um, so now I'll turn to uh, Commissioner Moody and then I'll come back over here to Commissioner O'Connor and then I'll try to give, um, hone in on a, on a couple recommendations. Um, if we want to make any today or if we want to table something and have this conversation at a later date. So, Commissioner Moody. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, Chief, Thank you. Uh, for all that you're doing, for all the officers doing the city of Grand Rapids. I am uh, in a place where I've had the opportunity to sit and talk with a number of people in the community over the weekends. I began Friday, Saturday, and uh, Sunday evenings uh, discussing what community policing was and is. Uh, I know that this community policing, uh, policing uh, um, investment that you're putting in today is different than what it was 20 years ago, because I remember we had community policing in Grand Rapids, uh, and, and at the time of Haggerty, and then around the time when uh, Chief Dolan came in, it kind of dissipated a little bit. Uh, officers did have uh, conversations with neighbors, and they were uh, in good relations with neighbors. I think that I just need a little bit more clarity when you say community policing specialist. You know, what is the word specialist added to community policing? Um, and, I, and I say that for a reason because I had mixed reviews over the weekend. Some looked at it as a negative, some saw it as a positive. Uh, those who saw it as a positive were those who were familiar with community policing from the old days. But when you put specialists on it, it, it kind of says, what are they going to be specialized in doing? Um, now, I'm in favor of the, of, of, of the of your getting the six officers primarily because of the fact I read the package and this is something that was that you guys were asked to do before I got here, and you fulfilled that. Um, I also feel, you know, within my own personal views on it, and that is that you know if we don't give you what you need sooner or later, uh, we're going to set you up to fail. I think that's important to think about as well too. Uh, but I need clarity on the, the specialist piece and what those, if those officers get the opportunity to become community police officers, what are their jobs and what would they be doing in the community? So, and I know you know this, uh, Commissioner, but I guess very succinctly, the community policing specialists serve uh, really as a, a separate unit within the department. So they, they attend a separate roll call at 8 o'clock where they meet with their service area captains. They work Monday through Friday day shift and the reason we do that is for the presence in the schools, the relationship with the businesses which are for, for a lot of them uh, daytime presences and the relationships with the neighborhoods and the neighborhood associations. So allowing us the six additional bodies would, would then give us the opportunity to replicate what we do in the daytime with 17, with six in the evening. So they're assigned to service areas. They answer to the service area captain. Generally speaking, we would prefer them not be first responders for calls. We want them to be able to take deeper dives and, and take problem-oriented policing and use it to resolve issues in their respective areas. So that that's... Relationships with people in the community. 
Very much so. The ability to sit down over a cup of coffee at 7 o'clock and talk for an hour and a half without having to be pulled away for a non-injury accident or a residential alarm or the variety of calls that first responders handle, importantly, but being tied up or freed up rather from the constraints of the radio to be able to concentrate on relationship building. So these officers would not be walking the streets like they did in the past? Now, I, I know when you mentioned uh, Chief Haggerty and, and uh, a little bit of Dolan, different times call for different measures. I, I know um, from my experience when crack was running rampant in some neighborhoods and some neighborhoods were unwalkable, different policing techniques took precedent. We're at a much better place as a community. We're in a completely different place as a profession. We're looking to build relationships. We're not looking to arrest our way. Um, to out of a problem. We recognize where we are and where we need to go. One last question, yeah. Mayor. Um, are these six officers, are they going to be placed in first, second, and third ward? So that's a great question. We actually talked initially about doing it with uh, using our service area model, which is north, south, east, and central which does uh, give us the opportunity with the number six to correlate it with wards as opposed to service areas. So while I don't want to set the precedent of making a uh, community policing specialist responsive or responsible to a specific ward or commissioner, I think that by the time we were done deploying them and doing scheduling and figuring out how best to use six to affect the whole city, inevitably they would be, uh, there would not be a ward that would not go uh, untouched or would not benefit from the addition of these officers. So every ward would see an increased presence in community policing specialists. Okay, thank you. I'll go to uh, Commissioner O'Connor and then I'll try to figure out kind of the mind and consensus of the body. So Commissioner O'Connor. Yeah, I guess I'll just I'll, I'll start with the reiteration of that if if the recommendation uh, if we're gonna wait for a recommendation from the 21st century policing regarding strategies to work on community police relations then I think we need to pause everything and and hold off spending any money until we know what those recommendations are so that we have the uh, you know uh, the most reserve available to implement any strategy with fidelity to the best of its ability and I think that's that's important that's the I think that is the fiscally responsible thing to do. Um, I really appreciate it, Chief, that you said you want 30 police officers. Like, I've been waiting for you to say that forthright, and you did today. And I appreciate you saying that. That you know, There is no department in the city of Grand Rapids, which I think we are, are in the weeds this far, trying to manage the solutions that they use on a daily basis to achieve an outcome. Um, we don't do it with the fire department. We don't do it with the water department. We don't do it with any department. But we're this far into the, into the weeds. Most departments, we say, this is the outcome. I want X to happen, and here's the resource bucket we give you, and you, you know, you're the professional. You do that, and so it is a little scary that we're in the the weeds this far on some of these solutions. Now I know that this is a different scenario, right, than than, than a lot of other departments. So Absolutely. we're trying to to navigate. Um, you know, it, I also hear the the idea that you know, Commissioner Jones, like I don't think any of us want an outcome. Uh, that looks that is negative. I don't think any man or woman that puts on a blue uniform every day gets up, goes to work, and thinks, "I want to." Like, they're all. N no one wants to have an incident that, that that comes to community attention. And so, while we've had incidents in 2017 that rose to that level, uh, I'm sure that every officer we, we haven't had one since. And it's like any road to to uh, recovery that you're you're getting to a point of like you have to start somewhere with one step first. And so. We've been X number of days without something that's come to that level of attention, and that I think that, that's progress. So these people are doing that. So I'll just I'll end here. Just I just it, I don't want to spend any of this money unless until we're done. Then I appreciate that. Any other final comments before I try to get uh, Commissioner Cuth? Yes, I would just uh, suggest that when staff put this agenda together for us, uh, and. Eric, thank you for sending this to us in advance so that we kind of knew how we were going to lay it out. Uh, they had to make a determination on how to put this package together. It could have been that they would separate out the cure violence piece with the assessments, which would be number four, five, and six. So they, they go together. But it happened to get wrapped up in this because we had this conversation around cure violence. Now, we've had it for five years. 
and we've embarked on, we've allocated the 7500 for the assessment, and that is underway. So I really hate to push pause on that. We're going to get kickback from the community, and, and for good reason. And, and the other thing, I think after listening to um, John Wachowski last week about the crisis intervention model, and then getting feedback from Network 180, um, I know I got some additional feedback and a report, which I think the whole commission ought to get and read. In addition to the fact that we're recognizing that uh, so much of our, you know, a good portion of um, those who go in the hospitals, for example, they said 10% that are coming in the emergency room are people with mental health crisis problems. And, and John just made a really compelling argument for getting started with that. So I would love to, I would like to move ahead with, with, um, with the crisis intervention model, with the cure violence work, and with the chief's um, request for proposals to secure consultant services for the purpose of conducting that staffing and deployment model. So that's where I'm landing. Uh, yeah, can I, I need to ask for a little clarity because I feel like we already made a decision as a body and took a vote to move forward with the initial assessment with cure violence and that that assessment is currently underway. Yeah. Like Would that work is currently being date, done, my uh, understanding. Well, it's under contract. So and we're working to schedule a date where it will be done in September. But, but that's already come before this body and we've already approved it. Yeah. Yep. So I, I, again, I, I don't necessarily feel like we need to backtrack on that when we as a body have already spoken, I think very clearly, even earlier this year during the budget session, telling the chief that exactly what Commissioner Kelly just said, that this has been a priority for years and we need to move forward and de determine This was more steps. of a statement of affirmation, not a decision point. So this is a, we've, what we've endeavored to do with the discussion about community and police relationships is put together a package. So the cure violence assessment is part of that package. And so when we put together this, we bundled everything in the package in there. Now, do we need to have paragraph four in there before again? Um, perhaps not. So, but nothing here is saying that we're not intending to proceed with that assessment. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's just it's under contract. It's under yeah. contract and we're working to schedule dates now. Yeah, and it's a contract that we already as a body have approved. So to me, I. I Yep. That, that piece was confusing to me. The second thing I just want to add to what Commissioner Kelly said, and this um, came to light uh, more so even after our conversation last week, is that you know, under Investment 3, there's a lot of work, just so everyone knows, there's a lot of work being done right now in the community around crisis intervention. The county is actively involved. Yep. Our department is actively involved. There are other partners in the community working on this. I don't, I don't uh, until we have from the community a model that they're recommending, whether it's the 23-hour crisis center or or a, a, a hybrid of that in partnership with our county. Commissioner Kelly and I heard from Commissioner Steck, who's been working on this at the county and in partnership with Network 180, and they're trying to figure out funding as well. I, I feel like that is even a little premature, knowing that the chief and John, is you're already we're talking about this, and you don't, you're not in a place right now to even yet, I would say, to make a recommendation on our role and partnership in that work moving forward. So again, I, I, you know, I, I think that's... Or if, I, if I could I understand what you're saying, if I could suggest that what we're trying to do is here with this one is say you're endorsing that we're doing this work. So the police chief and the fire chief and their staffs are both involved in the coalition that you talked about. And if we're not recommending a model because it's going to be a model developed by the partners. And, but we want to be part of it. And what this affirms is, yes, you want us to do this. So it's a, your official action saying, yes, please get on this, please do this, please be part of this process and keep us posted is how, I, how we intended that. Okay, well, okay. I guess it's a little confusing then because they're considered investments. Uh, so so I, I guess I, going back to what Commissioner Kelly said, so am I hearing a recommendation from you to continue on with this work that we're already doing in partnership with a number of other folks in the community, um, and then you want to pull out the deployment piece, or are you saying let's hold off on that until we hear from 21st Century Policing? Yes, I want to pull out number one and move forward with the um, staffing and deployment review. Because I, you know, we're already hearing from that task force that those are issues that we need to do a deeper dive on, and we heard that as well from Ron Davis. Okay. So, 
And, and just to clarify, based on Eric's um, comments, uh, as a body, I'm assuming that we are supportive of the chief and John to continue to work with the county and our other partners around looking at potential models for crisis intervention. My, is everyone supportive of that ongoing conversation with the county that, uh, that is happening with a task force that is already in place that the Network 180 and county commissioners are involved in? Commissioner? So uh, I'm not in opposition of that, but I, I do agree with Commissioner O'Connor's point um, that I don't think we can have it all of our ways, <laughs> you know, so something has to give. If we want to press pause on this one issue under the guise of let's look at this comprehensively to, and if it's something like the, the cure violence study assessment, excuse me, you know, I would say that that's underway and I think the city manager has spoken to that. I think um, having Grand Valley look at multiple um, um, evidence-based models, and including what Commissioner Ruppert is suggesting today to be a part of that, I think that's underway so that could probably, because those are studies, so you're not spending anything. But I think if we're looking at buying into anything, it, it should be a part of the comprehensive um, um, package that comes after a full assessment of the department that includes um, staffing, deployment, and things of that nature. So I, I agree with what he's saying. I think we, we are going to be in a position where we're nickeling and diming. And so if we're looking at this list, I just think um, what's listed here under the anti-violence model, 500 to a, thousand, to a million dollars, wouldn't be spent because we don't know what that model will be. Right. And part of the, what the assessment should continue, but agreeing to what the model will be shouldn't occur until after there's this more comprehensive view. And Chief, I don't know if, you've are, if you already have someone in mind to do the departmental review, but I'm just wondering if there's sure. a way to bring in um, Grand Valley, since they're already assessing in one way to do this other piece. I don't even know if this is something they could do, but I'm just thinking it would be great to kind of have everything, what comes from Cure Violence, what comes from what Grand Valley is doing, whatever Commissioner Ruppard and other commissioners are suggesting, to all be in one place, one report, so that we can look at one thing to fully see the big picture. Right. And, and so can I just add on, just to clarify, um, and, and Commissioner, I, I couldn't agree more, and, but I think we're in the same place with the with the yeah. work being done around what does a crisis intervention look like. Sure. That it's it's just premature mm -hmm. that we're not looking to invest any funds at this time because we don't know as a community what that potential model will be. Right. Um, I don't want to stall those conversations, but I also think it's premature to say that we're going to invest money in it when we don't know what that looks like or, quite frankly, the cost. So I would, I would add, I would consider that the same as the cure violence assessment. So you go through whatever those yeah. discussions are, and then whatever the outcome should be a part of this comprehensive report of everything. Yeah, thank you. I, mm -hmm. I think that's a good point. So, so to make sure that I understand, to both your points, um, we're in the midst of the crisis intervention model and continuing the, both the training and the relationship with Network 180, and we continue to expand that. That has no direct financial ramifications. That's a relationship that we've had for for a long time and then we continue to strengthen and we're continuing to explore new opportunities. Obviously, if any of them do have financial implications, we would bring that before this commission. Um, regarding the cure violence, as the interim city manager mentioned, that contract has already been approved, uh, but the work has yet to start. To answer your final question, Commissioner, I, I, it would be nice um, in terms of comprehensive to have everything presented in, in one package. Um, I don't believe GVSU has done a staffing and deployment study. Okay. Um, I've looked because I've, I've been looking since our last our meeting last week. There are a couple big players that are really kind of the gold standard. I would shy away from using ICMA. Uh, they came for a very distinct purpose. Mm -hmm. and it produced a very uh, distinct outcome based on the financial constraints at that time. Mm -hmm. I, I, for the same reason, I wouldn't recommend using the uh, international associations, the chiefs of police, to come in and make the recommendations. There are groups that will have the credibility and um, the objectivity to make recommendations that will be, I think, accepted by all parties. And could they then provide their portion to Grand Valley 
who could yeah. then bring all of those pieces together into one. That's a great, yes. Yeah. So once we once we know what the recommendations are for staffing and deployment, that can be a, an overlay to any uh, community mm -hmm. violence programs or any intervention models that we look to, to go down. And they would want that information to use in doing their staffing study. Sounds good. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, Commissioner Kelly, and then I'll try to button this up because we have one more walk-in item. So, Chief, probably between you and all of your contacts and even 21st century policing, which probably have the same question come up in other communities, you would be able to give us some or, or find some places, some, uh, some groups that could do this kind of assessment, I assume. The staffing and, sta and yeah, uh, the, sta the staffing. Staff yes, staff Michigan State University has done some. Alexander Weiss, who we brought in uh, when I first got here to take a look at how we were organized, has been involved in some. And there's also a group out of California that has done about 800 different municipalities. So there are some uh, some, some examples out there that could, uh, with a relatively quick turnaround, produce exactly what we're looking for. Yeah, and I think the one that did Austin's was a, a consulting firm called Matrix. Uh, and, and so I think I think you're right. There's a handful who are seen as experts and know how to do this and have a, a methodology already in place that could, as the chief said, probably turn it around relatively quickly. So, commissioner, uh, commissioner, oh. I just want to make a motion, uh, Mayor. I'd like to make a motion that uh, we approve the uh, items number two through seven for the uh, potential investment, um, which is a mix of investments um, that was presented by. Um, Interim City Manager DeLong, it's, again, it's items two through seven uh, that we move forward with that, uh, with those investments. Support? Okay, so I have a motion and support on the table. Any other comments? And then I'll call the question on this. Any additional comments? Going once, going twice. All right, all those in favor of approving two through seven, um, say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Nay. Nay. Okay, it carries. All right, commissioners, now um, I would like to ask for a motion to suspend the rules, and this is to bring forward a resolution for an employment agreement for our next city manager. Can I get a motion to suspend the rules? So moved. Support. All right, all those in favor of suspending the rules say aye. 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 Those opposed, it carries. All right, and this is a resolution electing the city manager and approving an employment agreement for the same. Uh, so all of you should have the attached resolution. This is to elect Mr. Mark Washington as city manager. Appointment becoming effective October 1 for a three-year term expiring December 31st, 2021. Um, city, our city attorney has taken the lead on this uh, and has gone back and forth in negotiations. Uh, city attorney, you want to add anything? No, just no. he's very excited and ready to get here and get started. Okay, so he's excited and ready to get here. Um, after this is approved, we'll move forward on solidifying it. And then, uh, commissioners, I already sent you a draft of an onboarding. Any additional feedback, if you could get that to me um, this week, and then I'll work on finalizing that and having a conversation with him. Um, so, commissioners, any comments, questions about this? All of you have had a chance to read through it. All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, it carries. All right, commissioners, so we have, let me run down a couple things for today because we have a full agenda. Uh, we have economic development project team at 1230 downstairs in 601. Commissioner uh, Jones, I take back my comment to you. Uh, it will be Commissioner Moody and Commissioner Rapart joining me for economic development project team. Uh, and then at 1.30, we are back in here for a 90-minute work session to get additional information on street lighting infrastructure. All of you should have been given a packet of information leading up to today's work session. Um, again, this is to get the information. This was a topic we talked about during the budget process where we felt we didn't have enough detail. Um, and then uh, our city attorney has asked that we cancel and reschedule the performance review, so that should be taken off your schedule. I think Laura already did that. Um, and then we are back in here tonight at 7 p.m. for our evening meeting. Commissioner Park. And I told Wimcat that I would say housing now discussions begin tonight. Yes, the other way ministries, you. 704 West Fulton, 6 o'clock. We have food and child care provided. I got a sneak peek on Friday, and it's fantastic what they're going to do. So. Please come show up. There's four sessions this week. Great. And we'll, uh, Amy, maybe we can get a reminder out about that. Sorry. You already did. Of course you already did it. Okay. Wonderful. All right, commissioners, with that, we are adjourned. And I'll see you. Oh, Eric, uh, am I right? There's uh, lunch downstairs? In the executive office. In the executive office. Yep.
So grab a bite to eat. Um, the two of you, I'll meet you in uh, economic development project team. Awesome. All right, we're adjourned.